All right, good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. I guess I should give the date if I remember it. Today is April 9th, 2021. And this is a uh, strategic planning session of the Prescott City Council and staff. Let's call roll, please. Mayor Mangarelli. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Scholl. Here. Councilman Blair. Yes. Councilman Good. Here. Councilmember Rusing. Here. Councilman Sishka. Here. And Councilman Tenney. Here. All are present. Very good. Thank you, Sarah. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, making time to be here with us today uh, for this uh, strategic planning session. I want to thank Hilton Garden Inn, Shane, and Stephen Shumway. You know, it's really cool to be sitting here overlooking Granite Creek uh, in the Hilton Garden Inn having this meeting after a lot of work and uh, strategy and, and uh, innovation to get this done. So really cool. Thanks, Hilton Garden Inn. I want to thank Barry for being here today and, and facilitating. Always good to see uh, Barry. Uh, I want to do a special thanks to uh, an old friend who has come out of retirement to do sound again, Ted Leonard. Or right, Ted, Ted, yeah. <laughs> Ted. <laughs> good to see you, Ted. Thank you. Uh, you know, we, we normally do these uh, in January, February, first of the year. Uh, COVID kind of messed that up, so it's good to get back together and to have this kind of conversation and I look forward to uh, some good conversation around vision and str strategic planning where we really think uh, thoughtfully and kind of go up to 30,000 feet and and really see uh, what some great ideas are for our city moving forward uh, several years down the road. So uh, with that, I think uh, Michael or Tyler, who, who wants to kick off here? I guess I could, and really the first thing we're going to do today is probably turn uh, some of this over to our friend, the lovely and talented Barry Ahrens, wherever he went. Is he still here somewhere? Yeah, I'm yes, he, yes, he's hiding. <laughs> um, Barry has been gracious enough most of the years that I've been here to serve as kind of the facilitator of the strategic planning dialogue that we have annually. And uh, I think he does an amazing job with that. And I also think that he was going to maybe spend uh, five minutes or less briefing you on the legislative session and all the exciting things that are being done to us, not with us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm supposed, what, what did you say I should be doing? You know, like this, like a rock star? <laughs> <laughs> Right, and I know I've got to stay close to the microphone, so what I was going to do is, is spend a few minutes to start on giving you a little update of what's going on at the legislature. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, this is my 51st consecutive legislative session down in Phoenix. Wow. And um, thank you. It, it's, a, it, it's kind of like, you know, survival of the legislature. That's... Uh, way it goes. I, I, I want to tell you that it's been difficult down there. And, and I don't mean politically. I mean it's been difficult because of some of the restrictions that have been placed on us because of the pandemic. And I get that. I'm not complaining about that. Everybody complain about the pandemic, but there's obviously nothing we can do. By the way, for those of you who are interested, my wife and I have both had both of our vaccinations, so I'm, uh, I, I'm good. Uh, there was a big it was a big stop, police cars and so on. You're entering Prescott, you have to show your card, you know, just yeah. kidding. Yeah. Um, so it's been difficult because the Senate has pretty much been closed to the public. And because of that, when you testify before committee, you've got to do it on a virtual platform. And, and much as we like to think that we've really become advanced technologically in our country, we've all got smartphones, we've all got computers and so on, there have been so many technical problems. We're just not quite there yet, and it's been difficult. You gotta sign up you know, ahead of time, 24 hours or two days ahead of time, and then you gotta get an email back that gives you a code so you can get in, so you can testify, and then you find out that you're watching the hearing, and then you get in and there's about a three minute delay so that you're hearing yourself after you testify and you don't know who's testifying, and so it's, it's been a problem. The House has been a little bit, a little bit looser I shouldn't say looser, but the House has been a little bit more uh, 
community friendly. They've had what they call hybrid sessions. So the committees, you can go and testify in person. You have to wear a mask and they've set the hearing room up with social distancing. They've got tape to, uh, so they've done a pretty good job. And that's been a little bit better. And those of us who are lobbyists, we like to kind of hang out down there because that's how we lobby. It's a relationship business. And you know we do it as long as we can until they realize that we're not down there to testify. And then they politely throw us out the door. Um, before I go on, I have two people I wanted to introduce to you. We uh, have a new associate at the Aaron's Company uh, who joined us December 1st. She worked at the legislature, and uh, so you will see and hear her, and that's Haley Howard. Stand up, Haley, so they can see you. Where did Emma go? Oh, okay. Emma is an intern. She's a senior at Grand Canyon University, and and uh, she's done a fabulous job. Uh, we've really been excited to have her, have her this year. So I want to talk a little bit about the legislature. A couple of bills I want to talk about. Uh, number one, I know we were all uh, hoping that the Tourism Marketing Authority bill would pass, and we, you know, it was a, we were up, we were down, we were up, we were down. It got out of the Senate committee with one negative vote. It got out of the House committee, and then all of a sudden it went to the floor, and it got killed on the floor, and then we resuscitated it. We brought it back. It, it failed the first time, 28 to 32. It passed the second time, 38 to 20. So we thought, OK, we've resolved the questions and so on, and then it got back over to the Senate, and uh, Senator Messnard said, well, now I'm not comfortable. I want it to be. Uh, an, I want there to be an opt-out provision, which I think the, the DMOs, the destination marketing organizations, were okay with. And I think that the communities like Prescott, I think we would have been okay with that. Uh, but the hotels down in Phoenix area said, oh, no, 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 because if, cause if uh, Joe's hotel over here is opting out and I'm opting in, then they're going to have a better price in the competition and so on. And he wouldn't move the bill without it. And without the hotel support, we couldn't move it. So we let it die. Um, it, and I will tell you that we now know, one of the great things about running legislation is you smoke out all the opposition. And we now know pretty much where everybody is. So we're going to spend the summer uh, getting together with folks to see if we can't resuscitate that. I, I want to thank John. Um, he's been very, very helpful through Tyler and through Michael in identifying some of the bills so that I can catch some things. Like there was a bill that would have required uh, the attorney general to approve the hiring of outside counsel in lawsuits. And we all believe that that came out of the pharma uh, lawsuits against the opioid companies, and, and uh, we were able to kill that bill. We stopped that one. It, it was moving in the Senate, and the League of Cities did a great job of stopping it. Uh, the short-term rental, uh, there were two bills. Uh, one was what I would call the industry bill, and one what I would call the, the, the cities bills, or the political subdivision bill. And what resulted was that the industry bill was closer to what was being considered. And the League of Cities, and I was involved in the conversations, the League of Cities came out and finally decided, if we accept a bill that doesn't do what we want it to do, return more authority in ordinances over those short-term rentals to the cities, if we accept something short of that, then the industry is going to be able to say, well, you don't need anything else. We solved your problem. And, and frankly, it wouldn't have solved the problem. So we're willing to hold out, whether we have to hold out till next year or even the year after, considering there'll be a new governor, because Governor Ducey is termed out, and he's been a strong advocate for the industry. There'll be new legislators. The place is going to clear out with one new congressional district. There have already been a half a dozen of them who've announced for various offices. Uh, so, but, but we can hold out because we want it to be good. We, we don't want it to be a bill that is halfway there and doesn't give us the ordinance authority that we need to control the environment. And I think that's what's most important to, to municipal officials uh, such as yourselves. Um, any other bills that you want to ask about? I'll make sure I don't kill myself here. Although I do have workers' comp, so you're covered. Um, anybody have any other questions about any other legislation? My best guess is we're about four weeks away from uh, signing die. They're beginning the budget process. They're getting all the bills out in dribs and drabs. So we're uh, uh, we're doing well on that on that score. So the budget 
where are we at with that? I know that you know the proposed flat tax was going to be harmful for us. Yeah, uh, that is Mr. Toma. And for those of us who are LLCs and therefore we don't file corporate income tax, a flat tax, depending upon how it looks, can be either good or bad. If it starts from gross adjusted federal, then it's okay. But if they're going to say no and we're going to just do a flat tax, depending upon what that flat tax is, it could have a negative impact on small business, which I don't think they want to do. But that apparently is something that is uh, uh, something they really want to want to push. I don't know whether it'll pass or not. Um, I will tell you that the other bill that has tax implications is Messnard's bill, which would allow a new classification of income tax payment uh, for small businesses. And the goal of that, of course, is to try to avoid the higher tax rate from Prop 208. I don't want to get into whether you like that or don't like it or something like that, but that's under consideration. I think things are fluid. I, I keep reminding uh, Haley and Emma and anybody I talk to that there's got to be a major meltdown before they can get everything together. That's just the nature of the place. And they haven't had that meltdown yet. The House seems to be a little bit further ahead than the Senate. Uh, I know the Senate had a caucus the other day and all the Republicans were saying how they were upset because the House seemed to have more information than they had and there were conversations about this one stormed out of the room and this one was upset and this one didn't say anything. And sound familiar? You know, um, Nothing's changed in 51 years, by the way. It's the same system pretty much every year. But uh, So I think they're probably about three or four weeks away before they can get it uh, get it together. Remember, the, the majority is only 31 to 29 and 16 14. So that means that they either have to have some kind of bipartisanship, which I do not hold much hope for, frankly, uh, or they have to keep everybody in the corral. Councilman? Barry, can you just really quickly, if you can, explain what, what goes on with a strike all bill? It is the lobbyist's best friend as a striker amendment. The, the first sentence of every bill is, be it enacted by the legislature of the state of Arizona. And one of the techniques that's used is, is to take a bill that is not going to be used anymore because it was either, you know, either the sponsor decided he didn't need it or it got from one house to the other and they decided, well, we're going to do something else. And then what they do is, is you, they want to they want to bring in something new or something that failed before that they want to try again. So they run what is known as a striker. And it's called a striker because the first line of the amendment is is uh, uh, strike everything after the enacting clause and insert. And that's why it's called a striker, because it, you're going to insert after being enacted by legislature. You're going to strike everything and start from scratch. I will tell you that occasionally. Uh, that's done because a bill is amended uh, so intricately that you really have to kind of start from scratch. I had a bill, uh, it was a water bill for the city of Prescott, I'm sorry, city of Scottsdale. You folks know I represent Scottsdale. And it would have affected Scottsdale, Goodyear, Tucson, and the Metro Water Company. And it had to do with remediation. And we had a bill, and it was codified, and it had more language in it, and so on and so forth. And it got out of the Senate. But then the chairman of the House Committee said, you know, this is kind of heavy. So we said, well, what if we just put it in session law and do what we need to do? And she said, fine. Well, we had her on a striker, because we couldn't fix it in the bill. It was the same subject. It was the same goal. And sometimes you run a striker for those reasons. Did we have another one? Haley, didn't we have another striker that was like that, where we we had a, 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 so much of changes in the bill that we had to run a striker? Yes, the, uh, yes, uh, 1042, which has to do with workers' comp. Uh, it, it, it got out of the Senate, and then there were some industry folks who said, we have a problem, we want to make sure it's fixed. So we had to fix some definitions. It was a very small bill, but the definitions that needed to be fixed uh, could not be done by a normal amendment, so we just ran a striker. Same bill, same subject, but we had to put it in a striker so that we could do the new language. Does that yeah. answer your question? Well, I hope so. Yeah. And, and sometimes they introduce what are known as technical corrections bills, which are 
what they call vehicles. In other words, it's a, it's a bill that's out there, and if a member needs to use it for a striker, they've got it there. But in order to use a technical corrections bill, you've got to get the speaker's permission, and usually you have to explain to him what are you going to do with that, and if he's not real excited about it, he's not going to let you, let you use it. He just won't assign it. So, Any other questions about legislation? I know that uh, Councilman Rusing and I had a lot of fun last year running around the legislature, and the problem got solved <laughs> without the legislature, and, and that, was, uh, that was a good thing. And uh, again, I want to thank John and, and Tyler because they helped me catch things that would have an impact on the city, and sometimes, like with the sober living homes, John was very deeply involved in writing the rules that resulted from that. So thank you all for being there. Let, let's go into the strategic plan. And let me, let me do a little time frame stuff. Uh, I know that we're scheduled to uh, be here through lunch and then till 2 o'clock. My expectation is we should be done with the, any revisions we want to make by lunchtime. And then I think uh, we can, if it's all right with the mayor, uh, I think then we can, after lunch, hold open if we want to have some further discussions or anything else. Does that meet your time frame, Mayor? Yeah, if we're done by lunch, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think we can probably set our goal to be done by lunch. You'll get tired of me after a couple hours. So, A couple of things I want to remind you of, because there are a couple of folks who are relatively new on the council who haven't gone through this. We've been doing this strategic plan now for about three years, maybe four. And you are one of the few cities I would compliment you on that actually maintains their strategic plan as an ongoing process. And I think you should pat yourselves on the back for that because it keeps, keeps you going in the right direction. A couple of things that we do. First, I want to remind you we work off of the paradigm of, of goals, objectives under the goals, strategies under the objectives, and tactics under the strategies. And, and, and again, as a reminder, normally the process is that the goals and objectives are the policy decisions that the council sets, and the strategies and the tactics are Michael Lamar and his team's responsibility. So I like to spend more time on goals and objectives because that's the vision thing, so to speak, and, uh, and not have to worry too much about what I would call the implementation, which is the strategies and tactics. Secondly, um, I know as city councilman you get a lot of constituent commentary. Uh, they all tell you how good you're doing, right? Oh, yeah. Every morning you get a bunch of emails that say, thank you for the great job you're doing governing the city of Prescott. <laughs> Sometimes you probably feel like you're just swatting away problems. And, and a lot of those problems sometimes come from, actually more than sometimes come from, uh, people who don't understand what a process is or don't understand what the implications are. And I get that. I understand that. But I think what you need to do is concentrate on the fact that, that you're not just a repository to be reactive to to constituent complaints. It's important that you take them into consideration, obviously. But that when we're doing a strategic plan, what you're really doing is, is you're looking at, at proactive policy and setting a vision for the city for both the long term as well as the short term. So that's what our goal is today. That's what we're kind of going to do. And, and uh, I did get a list of some issues that you wanted to bring up. And I'd like to go, do you all have a copy of that, of the current, the 2020, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're on. So if you go to goal number one, um, and, and let's kind of go through it. The goal number one is the stabilize the general fund, continue supporting the market compensation plan, and provide adequate and stable funding and flexibility to maintain the balanced budgets required by the charter. I, that's something that has been fairly standard in the strategic plan since the beginning. I uh, don't know if any of you have any uh, suggested but changes, but let's go through the rest of it before we discuss any changes. Uh, the first objective under that is to continue to stabilize the general fund. And I think that's probably one of those almost biblical 
type of requirements that comes down from the mountain on a tablet, and that's what you want to do. You want to stabilize the general fund. Second one is retire the PSPRS unfunded liability. You will remember uh, that the council several years ago uh, did two things. Uh, the first thing was they referred to the voters the 0.75 uh, tax, which was approved by the voters, which is over time going to reduce that that liability. And in addition to that, because of the hotshot circumstance, we went to the legislature and asked uh, Senator Fan to please see if we could get, I think the total amount is $7 million. And, and $7 million is a lot to ask for in one fell swoop. So what Senator Fan has been doing is put into the base budget a million dollars a year. I think we're in the third year of that. This will be the third year, and that's baked into the into the uh, uh, base budget. So that should continue on regardless of whether Karen Fan remains as president or even if she remains at the legislature. That's baked into the budget. That is a long-term policy decision that we got them to make. Now I've got to make sure it's in the <laughs> in the base every year, but that's my responsibility, and and we're pretty good with that. So with regard to the PSPRS, as far as an objective under the goal, we are still on the same trajectory that we were when we established that program. And I guess at some point in time, we may want to take a look at the numbers and see how we're doing, because there's a chance we could pay it off early on the 0.75, and it's always nice to tell the public we paid it off early and we want to now discontinue collecting it. Um, so I, I don't think we're quite there yet. But I think at some point, probably within the next 18 months to two years, we might want to look at those numbers. Barry, do you, we can get an update from Mark now. I bet he's yeah. pulled it up on his little machine. Please. His little machine. You need to take somebody's microphone, or the guy in the back corner who's wearing the mask as a chin strap is going to yell at you. Okay. Here, you. He's yeah, we, um, we, as council knows, we look at that every, uh, every year around December when the actuarial reports come out. We've gone from 86 million in FY17, we're down to 43 as of FY20, so we've gone from 30% funded to almost 70% funded. And um, I, as uh, we've talked about, I think we'll probably have it paid off by December of 25, which is a year and a half or yeah. two years early. Yeah. So, so like I said, that is a goal and objective that you folks set. The strategy was implemented by the staff, and it looks like we're ahead of schedule. So that, that's something that should, should remain as is. The, the next one says monitor legislative actions. Uh, the strategies are make impact fee adjustments. We have been uh, trying to do that through the League of Cities and Towns. Unfortunately, we have not been successful. I think that's going to take a change of leadership down at the legislature in order to accomplish that. I know I've been working with Councilman Good on that for the last couple of years, and we keep pushing that rock up the hill, and it keeps rolling back down o over us. So, uh, But we're, it, it is an issue. The League of Cities and Towns has it as an issue, and it's something that I suspect over the next three years will probably get adjusted. Uh, revenue and expense flexibility, and continue to monitor compliance of sales tax remittance from vacation rental websites. You will remember that the uh, hotel tax issue was addressed. That was part of what we had discussed. Uh, the tourism industry, actually, uh, and I represent the three largest uh, convention visitors bureaus in the state, and we took kind of a leadership role, and we actually got the Department of Revenue to acknowledge how that was being collected, and when the legislature actually made the change. Short-term vacation rentals are now supposed to be paying their, their taxes. Uh, whether they are is a function of enforcement, which you know, you, you really have no direct impact. That's back to that strategies and tactics thing, so. And then further assess the uh, uh, Section 115 tr trust options for the pension costs. I don't know if you want to leave that in there for the future or uh, uh, it doesn't hurt to have it there. Let, let me suggest a couple of things, and, and these suggestions aren't mine. Uh, I got a list of some suggestions that several of you submitted to the manager's office for consideration. One of them had to do with, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole pot full of money that the state of Arizona now has from either the CARES Act or the Recovery Act, and, 
and so on. The, the governor has uh, discretionary funds of more money than the entire state budget right now, literally. He's got $13 billion that he's sitting on, and the state budget will be less than that. And, and I have had a lot of my clients say, how do we get our hands on some of that money? Because we have real needs, okay? Whether, whether the real needs were, were COVID caused or an accoutrement to COVID caused or completely unrelated to COVID, uh, you know, obviously everybody's got needs. And, and what, what I have found is that the, the governor's office has certain set priorities that they want to deal with. And, and the trick is to figure out what your needs are that could be justified under the rules and then figure out a way to slot them in under his responsibilities. Um, trying to think of a a good example for that, but I will tell you that the tourism industry in Maricopa County, the tourism uh, bureaus get a small percentage of the stadium taxes when we built the Cardinal Stadium. And from July 1st to December 31st, what was supposed to be $3.4 million went down to zero because after they paid the fully subordinated bonds, they didn't have any money left, so they couldn't give us anything. And we went to the appropriations chairs and said, you know, could you ask if we could get some of that money for it? And they pushed and pushed and pushed. And the governor office says, no, that's not within our priorities. That doesn't mean tourism isn't his priority. What it means is, is that the utilization of that money for that purpose is not something we want to do. So what I'd like to open the discussion on here is to expand objective number three to include not monitor, just monitor legislative action, but I think it's monitor legislative, state executive, and political subdivision actions. Uh, so I'll throw it out if you want to comment on that. Anybody? Or is that something you're comfortable with? Thank you, John? Actually, Barry, if yeah. you could, has the governor articulated what his priorities are to maybe focus the discussion? In other words, if we know what the priorities are, we can sort of that, work within those. I understand that. That's, that's a great question. What I'm trying to establish here is that we add to our objectives that we, that we in addition to just watching legislative actions, that we add state executive actions and other political subdivision actions and and you know i i know sometimes people in prescott like to see us uh, ourselves as an island you know that we like the way things are and we really don't want to have a lot of change but we are surrounded by people who are going to force changes and the responsibility is whether we have enough of a vision to be able to be a leader in, you know. You know, it's the old story, when you're being run out of town on a, by a mob, get in front, pick up a baton, and prevent, pre, uh, pretend you're leading a parade. Um, the fact of the matter is, is, is what happens in this community is also a function of what happens in the communities that surround us and everything that happens in Yavapai County. Uh, so. I think one of the things that we want to do is look at as much cooperative engagement to accomplish some of these objectives as we can possibly come up with. And we're going to get to that because there were some very good suggestions on economic development um, where we were, we're going to talk about that. But what I'd like to do is to see if, based on your comments, if you think that adding in an objective number three, uh, monitor legislative, state executive, and other political subdivision actions would be something you'd like to add. And again, I didn't come up with that. That's what I, that's what I looked at from some of the materials that you, have, you folks had provided to the manager. You're just looking to broaden, broaden that a little I'm bit. I'm just looking to broaden the objective because I think it gives us a little more flexibility. And then if somebody says, you know, under our strategic plan, one of our strategies might be, let's see if we can't figure out how to access some of that money because, you know, the, the manager and his team has figured out that the governor kind of likes some infrastructure. I know infrastructure is one of those things that I think is in the governor's, to John's point, list. We have some infrastructure projects that we'd probably like to get some supplemental funding on. 
Um, so, you know, airport stuff going out at the airport. We'll get into a little more detail on that in the in the uh, economic development. But uh, so, yes, that's what I'm saying is let's expand the the objective of monitor legislative actions to include state executive and political state and other political subdivisions. I think that makes total sense, Barry, especially with every time we turn around, it looks like the federal government's printing money. Uh, I had this conversation the other day with the mayor that especially with this infrastructure money, the communities that are actually going to get their hands on it are going to be the ones that have their act together when the money is actually released. And we, the mayor and I had a conversation yesterday. We, I was talking to the CEO of Aviation the other day, and there's a tremendous amount of money for electric vehicles, mm -hmm. but it doesn't clearly delineate money for electric airplanes. So one of the things we need to do is make sure that if we're interested in seeing companies like Aviation actually get money for the electrification of aircraft, that that's actually in the legislation. So. Yeah, and another example, Barry, would be what uh, Councilman Blair is working on in terms of infrastructure and sewer hookup here in the city. And we know that federally there could be some dollars available, and we want to make sure we stay in that game and encourage uh, that bill to move forward and to have our foot in the door for that kind of funding here locally so we don't burden our local citizen. That, that's a terrific point. When we get to goal number two and uh, taking better advantage, I'm sorry, uh, utilizing regionalization approach for necessary, we started with airport and air park. I, th I got some recommendations that I think can be slotted in very well under that that deal specifically with some of that infrastructure stuff. So that's a great point and we'll get to it in a minute. Councilman Good. Uh, thank you, Barry. Um, I think it's particularly important that we be uh, proactive and prepared to have um, some of our potentially eligible infrastructure plans uh, pretty well planned and advanced. I think uh, as the clarification of the infrastructure funding comes uh, more clear, I think right now the only thing we know is you can't spend it on certain things. Um, I know the uh, county is looking at their potential allocation um, as the city's representative on the Central Yavapai Municipal Planning Organization. We know that there's going to be some substantial uh, dollars going into that community, so we wanted to be um, have some pre-study, pre-planning uh, proposals ready to go uh, once that clarification becomes uh, uh, more specified. I know when I was looking at the, um, uh, I think there's a classification by city of a qualified versus a non-qualified city. Some of the um, um, allocations that potentially are going to Prescott Valley relative to what uh, Prescott would receive are significantly different. And I'm not even clear what that, um, how that is designated. So I think it's really important that we not only monitor, but we start working on preparing some proposals in advance. So once that clarification is made, then we're going to be at the front of the line to be able to uh, be considered for some of those allocations. And that's why it's probably important to talk about, and that's, that's why I think including the po other political subdivisions is a good idea. There are certain infrastructure projects that are not indigenous to just the city of Prescott. Right. All right, Councilman Roosing, yes. Thank you. I'd just like to comment that, uh, as you know, we're well aware of the competition between urban areas and rural areas, and I think we need to be aware that uh, sometimes the dollars don't get spread even evenly, and the rural er areas are overlooked. So I think we need to work and uh, work hard and make sure that they're distributed to out to the rural areas and not just get hoovered up by the urban areas, Maricopa County. That, in particular. Yeah, I know the state of Maricopa. I hear that all the time down at the legislature. Councilman Sishka. Thank you, Barry. My impression is, is that the government or the governor knows more about what he doesn't want than what he does want. Is that a fair statement? No, I wouldn't agree with that. I, I, I think that there's more publicity given to what the governor says he doesn't want than the things that he is doing. 
but I would say to that point and to both uh, Council Member Good and Council Member Rusing, you can get better recognized, and we're back to the regionalization thing, you can get better recognized and have more impact on getting in the queue, if you will, okay? If you are doing things as a larger entity, you know, if the, if the city of Prescott comes down and says, we want $300,000 for X, well, you know, that's just a, it's a small area. It's very, you know, very, but if all of a sudden Prescott, Prescott Valley, Chino Valley, and Yavapai County join together and say, look, we've got a major infrastructure project that's going to benefit the entire group, all right? And, and I think that's the vision thing, having a vision that says, we're going to be in the leadership as the city of Prescott getting all of our neighbors and the other political subdivisions that are over us, like Yavapai County and so on, together to come up with unified projects. Now, part of our responsibility as the staff, I include myself in that, is to be able to figure out, okay, what are those governor's priorities? And then if we have a sewer project that we know we may want to do on a more regional basis or a water project or uh, and and I have sung this song by the way for a long time you gotta widen 69 it takes me longer to get from the sign that says welcome to Prescott Valley in here than it does to get from Phoenix up there that's a little bit of an exaggeration but that's the kind of project where you could say, you know, if there's infrastructure funds and the governor can designate X millions of dollars to DOT to widen 69 and maybe make it a limited access parkway as opposed to a street, which is really what it is with traffic lights. There's, there's a new traffic light every time I come up here, okay? Um, and they're not synchronized. I mean, you know. And, so anyway, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not trying to editorialize. What I'm saying is the comments that I've just heard from, from the three council members who just spoke suggests that that type of taking the leadership role and figuring out what we all need on a regional basis, collecting it, figuring out how to slot it into the governors, and that's the advantage of changing that, that objective to include all political subdivisions in our neighborhood and the executive branch. Councilman? So what you're talking about is expanding local part or local partnerships? Yes. So that would mean calling a meeting with all of our local entities and, and saying what are our priorities? What should our priorities be as an area? Yes. I don't know at what level, but yes, that would be a strategy that well, I what would... What can we all agree on? What can we all agree on? And I'll take it one step further. I think that the city of Prescott is well positioned to be able to bring the vision to those and say, here is what we should all being agree on. And when you dangle dollars in front of them, they become far more agreeable. Yeah. That's reality in, in government, right? I've got, got a comment. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Blair. One thing we always keep sidestepping, and, and it has to do with more so about a growth entity, uh, people want to look at our regionalization of our being able to bring in the big Chino water as a growth factor. But this is an exact area because we're a designee of the state with an AMA where we should be managing our water collectively by including Chino Valley, Prescott Valley, Dewey Humboldt in the same aquifer to be able to bring us into safe field and be able to do the right thing, not for today, but for the future. And this is where we need to have the help from our other communities with the state of Arizona as a long-term project to bring this forward. Otherwise, 50 years from now, we're sitting here still fighting over the same thing of whether it's doing the right thing for the region or is it about all about growth again? Great example. A a that's, a, that's a great example under the infrastructure, which we'll put a little meat on the bone on when we get there, but that, that is a great example. I'll give you an analogy just to, just to paint the picture a little better. The Arizona Municipal Water Users Association and the Southern Arizona Water Users Association said, you know, if there's, a, if there's a water emergency in a particular community in Maricopa or Pima or Pinal County, notice I added Pinal and Pima just so that we're not just talking oh, yeah. about Maricopa. 
if there's, if there's a real major shortage, well, we know that there's stored water down there right now. There's a lot of water in the aquifer that's stored that's not accessible until there's an emergency. And in order to get that water, then if there's an emergency, you got to get a declared emergency. You have to go to CAP. CAP has to go to water banking. Water banking has to go back to CAP. And then you first get the water. And we said, if there's a water emergency, that's a hell of a lot of steps. And CAP sits on the water banking board. So we passed a bill this year. Um, I think it, Haley didn't, 1147, that's headed to the governor now, right? Yeah. No, it, does, it, it didn't have any amendments. So it, it's headed to the governor. And they said, well, is there water? Why do you need it? It's a water emergency. There's no water emergency. Why do you need this? because we want to prepare for it so that when there is an emergency, we don't have to run to you and say, oh my God, now that you've got to fix it. And I think to your point, that's exactly what we're talking about. Well, it's not going to do anything but get more expensive in the future. No question. So everybody should be planning on that and have an ultimate goal as a region to bring the pipeline and that infrastructure forward. The question becomes is we don't necessarily need to use it, but if there's an emergency, here we are sitting in the same scenario. It, 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 that's exactly, that's why I painted that picture. I think it says that there are other examples of it that we can utilize, even if in some cases you need to go to the legislature and ask them to, to John's point on some of the things that I suggest, you have to make a little bit of a statutory fix to facilitate it. I look at, not to keep bringing it up, but I look at Payson and Payson was on the vine dying. Mm -hmm. If you're not growing, you're dying, and that's been proven over and over again. And they went out and got federal money and funds to bring water in from the Blue Ridge, Ridge Reservoir that cost them millions and millions of dollars. But now they're secure in their water future, which means that they can bring in industry and things that they need to have to survive. And they had to work with the Department of Water Resources, right. which is part of the executive branch, which justifies us expanding that objective to bring it in. So if there's nothing else, Barry, I just have I'm one sorry, other question I apologize. to follow on with that. Yes. Look into your crystal ball. How long is this nine or 13 billion or whatever it is going to be available? Until it's spent. I, I hate to be sarcastic about it, but that's the truth. The fact of the matter is, is that, uh, I don't know if you've been watching the media reports, but there's a big battle going on between the legislature and the, and the Department of Education on the fact that the Department of Education still has a whole pot of that money that they were allocated that they haven't used. And yet, the Gilbert School District just laid off 154 or 124 teachers. 152. Okay, I was close. How about that? All right. Um, so the answer to your question is until it's spent. And they haven't spent it all, which means they don't have plans yet to spend it all, which should be a, oh, they don't have plans. So what we've got to figure out is what are their priorities so that we can tell them here's a good plan for a way that you can spend that money. And, and I think that the governor's office has some real talented people who work with him, who are helping to develop some of the implementation. He's got his priorities. He knows what's important. But then it's a matter of how do we get them, and that's where we come in. And if we can get a regional approach and say, here are some infrastructure programs that if you've got the money for it, we should be able to do it now, could, could help. Does, does that... I, I just, don't know. Just one more thing. I mean, there's so, no deadline. So, so Prescott is is part of the AMA, but it is not the AMA. Correct. It's called the Prescott AMA, and that's unfortunate. But so here we are. Actually, it's not. It's very fortunate that it's called the Prescott AMA because it enables us to take a leadership role. I, I look at it from the broad back, but go ahead. I apologize. Okay, I don't quite look at it that way. Uh, it also allows people to beat on Prescott. Well, that's true and, too. And let the other the other part of part of the AMA go, you know, go without. So anyway, doesn't it seem as though a regional priority ought to be safe yield? Would that work as a driver for some of this money? Yes. Yes, and, and that's why I think you are, and again, I didn't come up with this idea. <laughs> uh, you are 
saying, let's broaden the scope of what we're looking at to be more than just the city itself. Let's look at the cooperative opportunities that are going to enable us to get things done for us that's going to, that's going to benefit the entire region. And conversely, having the entire region is going to make it a little bit easier for us to get those things done. One of the, one of the drawbacks that we've had here, though, seriously, when you start talking about what Steve's looking at is regionalization, and that's getting beat upon when we talk about an AMA. That includes Yapai County, which is a huge county. Right. And our supervisors have no water authority. Correct. Period. Because they're getting their wells when they're in the county from the state of Arizona, and essentially filling out a piece of paper, and now you have a well. And you start talking about water production, safe field, and all these things. They just blew that whole picture out of the window because there's nobody controlling that side of it. So when you start talking about having a water, and I don't want to say authority, but it's really what it is, is saying county can't help us because they're not in the position to. So who, ha who has to do that? And that's what the governor needs to understand, that we need to take the leadership role for Yapai County and saying, here's what we're going to do. Right, and so, we have to do it in a cooperative effort with the Arizona Department of Water Resources. That's right. Right, John? Yeah, it, right, Barry, and I think it's important, and maybe the council knows this, but it's important to reiterate that, that adding, making those changes is codifying something that a lot of us are already doing. Correct. In other words, there are discussions amongst, at a staff level amongst the cities and towns in the AMA to talk about regional authority or regionalization of, of water and sewer. So it's not just sort of this balkanization of different communities doing their own thing. So those discussions are going on. I know uh, myself and my department, we're very involved in, 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 with the league attorneys, the, the other city's attorneys on being on an amicus um, committee to, to, you know, when, when a city gets sued, you know, does the league or do other cities join in as an amicus to help kind of guide the outcome of that. Um, I know, you know, for, for instance, Sarah is involved with the clerks in the region and statewide. So there's a lot of that going on at, at your staff level, um, a lot of regional and statewide work going on. So I think making that ad is, is really sort of stating something that, you know, is already going on, at least at a staff level. And ultimately, a lot of those things will percolate up you know, whether it's, whether it's a regional authority or whether it's, hey, do we want to get involved in this lawsuit? You know, we get involved in election lawsuits oftentimes. So um, I think this is a good ad because it's stating something that, that is happening. Um, but I, I don't think it's necessarily publicized as much or people are aware of it. I think it raises the awareness on the part of the, the council is raising the awareness of that and instructing the staff now to go ahead and work hard to implement that on that basis. And, and I, I well, hope the, I'm the not talking with, out of school. The doing yeah. it on a staff level is if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, did it fall? So it, it's got to funnel our way to the political yeah. entity so That's it, right. it can actually get some legs. Right, but I think, I think the point is, is that you got to kind of knock out or pick the low-hanging fruit or knock the things out that just simply aren't going to have any agreement uh, and, and then bring it to the policymakers to say, hey, this is where your, your respective staffs are kind of agreeing on the options, and then you get, the, you get to choose from realistic options rather than sort of talking at a hypothetical level where if you know you can't get a, co a collective agreement at, at, a, at a lower level, you'll never get it at the higher level. So it's trying to winnow down your options to, to something that's realistic. That's where, that's where it's coming from. Well, I think that urgency from the higher level may drive that situation. And that's where I think this ad makes sense. Yes, I think well, you two are saying the exact same thing. And I think we're looking at a directional, the council is now saying, we want to make this an objective. We want to work harder to access the state, not just the governor's office, but the Department of Water Resources and you know, maybe the land department and so on. And we want to actually access other political subdivisions. So we want to take a higher profile on that so that we can instruct staff to do that. Now, I, let, me, let me also say something to what John said, because I think it was really important. Most issues are not singular issues. They are a menu of issues that make up the whole. And, and 
when, when I go down to the legislature as an example and say, you know, here, here's what we want to get done, and it's a, it's a panoply of maybe a half a dozen things, and maybe there's somebody who opposes what we want to get done, and invariably the government will say, I can't give you everything you want, how much are you willing to live with? And that's what you're, that's what you're saying is, and, and you start negotiating things like that because over time you get incremental gain. So I, this year we get a little bit of right. this. I, Michael? I, I certainly understand where John's coming from around the margins. Right. But let's start at the staff level. I feel like the staff gets mixed signals about whether or not this council wants us to be a regional leader in water provision because sometimes I feel like the idea is that we should be out in the unincorporated area and working with other municipalities and sometimes it's like we have no interest in doing that. And then another part is it's all well and good to say let's get all the regional players around. I guarantee you there's not another regional player that wants the city of Prescott to be the leader in water provision. Well. We also, so so it's, it's all great to talk about platitudes. I'm John's laughing. Do you think I'm wrong about you? No, I'm agreeing with you 100%. That's why I'm smiling. I, it's, so you, we can work on things around the margins and get Chino's commercial district a little bit of water here and there. But for us to take a leadership role in importing water from the big Chino or being the regional leader in water provision beyond the city limits of Prescott is a policy decision that I don't think I get clear direction on. Well, that... And you're right, but also the leadership changes. So when you had leadership in Chino Valley, there was a time when they didn't want anything to do with the city of Prescott. Now you have a mayor that wants to be part of what we're trying to help them with. You got a new mayor in Prescott Valley that wants the same thing. So when those things change, that's when you jump on board and make the changes. Otherwise, you just beat your head against the wall. It's the same with the sewer. The sewer should be a regional thing. You know, we get our water out of an aquifer and all the sewage and all the septic tanks that are out there in Chino Valley, Prescott Valley, Yavapai County are all putting their sewage back in the ground. And at some point in time, they're going to contaminate what we do and what we drink out of. It should be, without a doubt, listening to our consultants saying we should recharge every single piece of sewage that we can and treat it to put it back in the aquifer. That's the right thing to do for the streams and for the lakes. So that's another regional concept. And we shouldn't be afraid of those things. Mayor? I think, yeah, thank you. I, I, I relate to and understand Michael's comment. And I, uh, I think for us, it's more of an influence. That, that's where we start, is we do what we know is the right thing. We lead, we influence. And I think we, we try to partner when we can, when it's, you know, as, as Steve is mentioning now, when, when that opportunity exists, we, we want to partner. But uh, there's a long history of, of municipalities not partnering up here, and it's going to be uh, a <laughs> while before we can overcome that, I think. Um, I think in terms of funding, we need to partner uh, more, uh, back to your point, that we need to come together to then show some influence to the state and Fed to get money. Uh, but I think with our water, we just have to do what we know is right and move forward and hopefully others will follow. I think you have both options available to you by including as part of the uh, objective on your strategic plan to expand that now, not just to legislative action, but to executive branch of government in the state and the other political subdivisions. Yes, Member Rusing. Uh, thank you. I'm glad we touched upon uh, water because that, that is a huge topic, as you know. We're going to touch on it more in a yeah. minute. <laughs> but uh, as far as uh, regional cooperation, this is where we can become, we are already leaders in uh, our conservation <laughs> program here, and we really could bring other people like Prescott Valley under this umbrella and uh, improve water conservation throughout the region, not just in Prescott, because as you know, uh, we have many straws, but they all are coming out of the same glass. Yeah, Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Since we've kind of migrated the conversation into infrastructure, I, I think we're pretty good on the first goal uh, with the additions that, this, that the members have made. Um, if you move to economic development, 
uh, because I think it's under economic development that we have an opportunity to look at more infrastructure. So the first one is take better advantage of community assets, and I got a suggestion from one of the members that we really need to weave into the strategies there. I, I don't think it's necessary for us to come up with the exact language, but I think Michael and Tyler and I can probably come up with it that we need to highlight the visitor industry. John, I'm talking to you. Uh, we need to highlight the visitor industry with regard to, uh, you know, we're talking about maximizing revenues at existing city owned operated locations, and I think we need to. Uh, uh, maximize uh, opportunities for the private sector visitor industry. I mean, and this, this building is probably a great example of that. And the conference center, I guess, it's going to open across the watch there. I hope they build a bridge. There is one right behind you. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 thank you. Yes, yeah, 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 and I know one of my staff will probably say, don't you remember that, Barry? And I said, no, I wasn't there that long ago. But um, so I think one of the things, unless there's any objection to that, I think adding a visitor industry component as a strategy to the objective of taking better advantage of community assets. This is a community asset, this building. And therefore how John and his people uh, and the, and the Pres Prescott Chamber of Commerce sells this, now that all of a sudden you, it's no longer, we have this battle in the industry all the time. It is not the tourism industry. When you think tourism, you think grandma and grandpa coming out as winter visitors, okay? That's tourism. What we're talking about is the visitor industry and where the real money is and where the real economic development is, is in saying, you know, you got a conference that's got about 50 people. Well, we've got this brand new, beautiful hotel, and it's got a conference center. You know, when when I put I put a lot of conventions at the Haciampa. You're welcome. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, and, and that's because I'm looking for. A, I've got statewide organization. I'm looking for a central place. Well, the Haciampa's got it. What they have is, <laughs> which they didn't always have, is that room, that that building off to the side. Okay. And, and the roof is a great place for events, for lunches and, right. and receptions and so on. Visitor industry, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about people are going to come up here in the summer from Phoenix and from other places. By the way, I just saw in True West magazine that Prescott was declared again the number one. Did you see that, John? The number one Western town. Somebody doesn't like that, but anyway, it's... No, it's just that everybody wants to close the door, but yet we get recognized for all these accolades. And then this is the problem that I have, is this very building we're sitting in, the disdain that came from the public about how dare the city get involved in this to bring this thing here. But now look at it. Now everybody applauds that fact. So the role <laughs> as the council being elected is to do the right thing for the community, because you're always going to have the naysayers out there that I, don't want the change. I, I had a boss at Mountain Bell. How many of you remember Mountain Bell Telephone? Raise your hands. Mountain Bell. That's the very yeah. building you're in over at Tassie. I know. All right. And, and of course, it became U.S. West and then Quest, and, and now it's CenturyLink. I think they're changing their name, too. But when I worked for Mountain Bell, I had a boss who used to tell me when I would come into his office and pound on the table about philosophically, it's the right thing to do philosophically, and he'd say, Barry, Every once in a while, you have to rise above principle and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I think this building is a perfect example about that. You know, in principle, well, you know, the, we should be using taxpayer dollars to do this. Well, if the, if the benefit is going to be to the taxpayers, that's something to consider. I'm not, I'm not quantifying or qualifying whether it's beneficial or not. All I'm saying is, is that it's exactly what you said, is that this building is now a visitor industry asset to the city of Prescott. And when you add the, the uh, thing over there, then it will be even more of an asset. Now when you come up here, you've got several places if you want to have a conference that's got 30, 40, 50, 100 people. Gary, I'm noticing on strategies here, it says maximize mm -hmm. revenues at existing city-owned operated locations, et cetera, et cetera. But I just look at what we're doing with the uh, Center for the Future. 
we're not maximizing revenues, we're maximizing opportunities for Prescott. And, and, and I, I really do think that, that maximizing revenues is the wrong way to put this, so to speak. I, I think that, that we can use our assets to improve the overall attractiveness of Prescott to economic development entities or future economic development entities. I think we're, we're, we're not looking to the future when we say maximize revenues. And that's, that's your call. Member Tenney? So I, I would agree with what I think Steve is saying, which is that we don't want to limit ourselves to things that, that are revenue generating. There's certainly, uh, th there's a place for that. I don't, I'm not But sure I think if I you would... look at, at the next two bullet points, um, I think that's what addresses those, I think, or, and maybe those can be clarified or made better, uh, the second and third bullet points Well, I there. think that if we, if we kind of change a few words in the first thing, it will funnel into the, the other Possibly. two bullet points. Yeah. Member Tenney, you I, I think there's room for uh, possibly the addition of, of things that simply maximize our quality of life here in Prescott and are not revenue generating. So if, if that's um, implicit in what follows, terrific. If not, maybe that's something we ought to look into to making explicit. I, I think if I could throw out a suggestion, if I'm listening to you correctly, I think if you wanted to take the word revenues out and put in economic opportunity. All right. Tyler, did you? I like that. But then I think, Barry, you've got the second clause, which talks about reasonable market rate and, and center for the future. Um, ultimately, they'll be paying rent, but the first year it's essentially free rent to get them in, and then the, and then the rent grows. But I think what Councilman Shishka's point is, is sometimes you have to forego um, or reduce rent or reduce revenues because you have a different benefit right. in mind or a different goal to achieve. Yeah. We're certainly Perhaps, not, I'm sorry, I, number 10. I apologize. We're certainly not maximizing revenues with our golf course, but it adds to our quality of life. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I know we've, no, we've no, I appreciate that. that. But if Other we times, add, but that's, if that's we add economic that's opportunity important. as opposed to revenues, okay, and if we look at the where it says reasonable or appropriate market rate, then of course it gives you a little leeway. Is Very that? Good. Yeah, I'm just, there's a fly bugging us over. Uh -oh, okay. <laughs> is that is that okay with everybody? Does that meet your needs? So we will add after reasonable in front of market rate, um, reasonable uh, and appropriate. And then I, I guess my question is: Is ra would it maximize opp economic opportunities or economic benefits, or does it make a difference? Um, to be honest with you, I like opportunities. Okay. I think it expands that op the options more than benefits. Uh, yeah, I agree sense. with uh, Member Good, Councilman Shishka, that um, an appropriate use of um, government is to create those um, opportunities and allow the private sector to take advantage of them and let them create the benefits, uh, both economically and and especially with the center of the future where you're starting with uh, startups that haven't been able to um, really scale up and, and create um, financial uh, future benefits and with the city supporting uh, those opportunities, it gives them the opportunity to, to actually uh, create a, a legitimate business that um, supports the community at large. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that goes to the point that both Member Shishka and Tenney were talking about, where economic opportunities is probably the most appropriate phrase. And, and that's, that is a strategy that then the, the staff can feel more comfortable and more flexibility there. Um, and again, uh, adding a, 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 another strategic bullet point related to the visitor industry, I would ask that you allow us as staff to kind of come up with that language because we, but it's important. And again, this building demonstrates why it's important to include that as a strategy.
Uh, under utilize the regionalization, this is where we go back to some of the conversation we had before. I got lots of suggestions that under regionalization, I know we were focusing on the airport and air park growth. Um, I apologize. That's okay. Member Shaw, yes. Can we hop back up? I'd like to um, revisit bullet three under objective one. Sure. I would like to add K-12 schools into this bullet. I think we have some great partnerships with our K-12 schools in the area. And partnering with our K-12 schools to keep our students here instead of them leaving for college, I think is, is something we should strive for. An example of one of our great partnerships is our Nature Center and Granite Mountain School. We have students going over there every day and learning about nature and having outdoor classroom space and making this kind of a quality of life thing for students, not just university students. Absolutely makes sense. Any objection to that? And we would add K-12 um, probably right after. Actually, I would put it before. Uh, so it would say uh, partnerships uh, with K-12, uh, with the K-12 community, local colleges, and universities. I think K-12 community probably encompasses public schools, private schools, charter schools, and so on. Make sense? All right. Um, let, let me move down to the regional. Thank you, Member Shaw. I apologize for no not worries. seeing you. I'm trying to scan the crowd. <laughs> These guys are going to have to be separated. They're having way too much fun. We're strategizing. Yeah. Not the first time. Not the first time. <laughs> at least up there on the dais, you know, when you're in the council room, he's at least slightly. Yeah, they got removed. a glass partition between us. But there you go. <laughs> It's not let's, an air for COVID, it's there to keep us from chatting. <laughs> Objectives, um, <laughs> that's very funny. <laughs> Objective number two under economic development, utilize regionalization approach to support necessary airport and air park growth and development. That, that remains consistent. What, what we want to look at is whether, and this again was the recommendations that came from some of the members who, who put in is, is including sewer, water, and transportation infrastructure to that regionalization objective. So it would read, use a regionalization approach to support uh, necessary airport and air park, comma, sewer, comma, water, and other transportation infrastructure growth and development. It becomes a broader I think one of the things that you're probably, I'm beginning to realize is, you know, we started pretty narrow in this strategic plan, and we're now adding a lot of meat to the bone, and I think that's healthy for you. So I, I from the material I got from you folks, I had sewer, water, trans and transportation infrastructure as part of the regionalization objective. Does that, is that comfortable? And then under the strategies, um, one of the recommendations that came out, and, and again, I, I don't want to single out any members, so one of the um, items that came out was ingress and egress at the airport as a strategy. And did you have a... Oh, I, I support that wholeheartedly. <laughs> I think uh, the lack of... Um, strategic planning on making sure that access, ingress, egress, et cetera, into the airport is something that we've um, uh, not uh, done an effective job for. And the way it's developing, it's going to be uh, more and more problematic for all, all of our regional partners, whether it's coming down from 40 through uh, 89 through Chino Valley and trying to make sure that the access into the uh, airport is um, is safe and uh, effective, or uh, whether it's coming uh, north from uh, 89 or even 89A from uh, Prescott Valley and, and the other areas um, <coughs> down Dewey, Humboldt, et cetera. So um, I think this is another opportunity that um, a really effective regional approach with our partners to be able to say all of these assets, whether it's um, uh, water resources, whether it's the big Chino water uh, ranch and the pipeline that goes along with it, whether it's the airport. Um, now is the time to really sit down 
with our partners and say, we have not only the incentive now financially through some of these uh, federal uh, grants, et cetera, but um, we can take some initial steps to work effectively together to reach a larger uh, goal. Um, in some of my professional experience negotiating contracts, sometimes partners would really uh, put their uh, heels in and not move because they were fighting for that bigger um, um, success in a competitive manner. So you step back and say, well, what are the little steps that we can agree on? And as you start to move and create some momentum, then you um, have a better chance of achieving those bigger goals. And now with uh, the ability to uh, access some of these uh, large uh, federal grants that are channeled through the state, um, there's not only the financial but the regional um, incentive for our partners to start working together in a legitimate manner. Excellent points. I think with the federal dollars that could be available, I mean, how many commercial flights do we have going out of the airport now? We have three today, and we'll, no, three with United, four with United. Four. Four. I see the yeah. lady who with knows in the back coming. there. Yeah. With a four. fifth coming. Yeah. And a fifth coming, yeah. okay. And, and it's a regional airport. I mean, yeah, people Yeah, it needs from, to be. What? It needs to be. Yeah. and and. We need to sell it more as a, a regional airport, and we need to, and, and therefore, including that ingress and egress as a strategy, you've now given direct instructions to the city manager and staff to say, <coughs> now you've got to go find the money to improve the ingress and egress. Member Shishka? You know, my concern with the whole process that we've had over the years is that we've always looked at the differences between the communities and not the commonalities of the communities. Good point. And I think that I, I'd like to see in this number two somewhere here establishing commonalities with the region. And, and you know, we, we like the airport, we always talked about, well, I think Prescott Valley ought to throw in this much if it's going to be a regional airport. and. Chino Valley ought to throw in this much if it's a regional airport. But that's not what we need to look at. We need to look at how can, what kind of commonalities do we have between those communities and how do we maximize our regional effort, particularly with the political entities down in Phoenix, to gain the best for the entire region. Okay, I, I wrote down some notes while you're talking because I think you had a couple of good words that we could probably weave into this. Uh, something to the effect of instead of just use a, utilizing a regional approach, utilizing the established regional commonalities uh, in an approach to support or something like that. Yeah, I think the commonality somehow has to fit in there. I, I, and I wrote that word down. Because <laughs> we've concentrated too much on our differences. No, I appreciate that. I think... Member Shaw? A regional partner we haven't mentioned is the tribe. I mean, mm -hmm. they're an island in, in our city, and it's, it's been a, you know, a struggle with, with our relationship historically. And I think that's something that we have been working on but should, should be written down or codified somehow so that we continue to, to improve that relationship. I think one thing that's not in here, which def desperately needs to be put in here, is the focus on commercialization of our airport opposed to residential. And there needs to be a collective mind thought on the council of how that airport develops to keep residential out of the flight paths. When you talk about the north-south flight path and what they're wanting to do at Deepwell, I'm absolutely opposed to. When you start talking about a developer wants to build houses because they walk away from them and they make their money. Yeah. It's harder to entice regional cooperation with warehouses. You have CP Technologies that's moved out here for, for a quality of life and, and also because of what we have to offer. And they've made it very clear to me there's four or five different companies that are going to tag along with them. But yet, if we put all this residential out there where it should be commercial and industrial, then we're going to lose the effectiveness of what we're calling the regional airport 
And there, we lose our effectiveness with Prescott Valley and Chino Valley because now we're swallowing up everything we tried to build by letting houses come in that have no value after a certain period of time. So I, I think it needs to be in here as a strategic focus on that airport to reduce residential and to accelerate commercial and industrial. Thoughts? I will tell you that if you build houses, you will reduce the amount of air traffic that is uh, going to be utilized out there. That's well, just I the totally, fact. I totally agree with Councilman Blair. Um, for the regional airport to be an economic driver, we have to be able to uh, secure those uh, buffer areas for legitimate um, aviation-related or technology-related areas. And the more that we allow uh, rooftops and residential development to either neighbor those areas or actually encircle them makes it very unlikely that uh, no, more companies like CP Technologies would be attracted to this area so because they know they've got a legitimate future to uh, grow their business. Uh, and and l let, me, let me throw out a thought here. I, we're, I know we're kind of bouncing back and forth, but that's okay because it's good conversation. Um, and I don't want to touch any third rails or hit any you know, tender nerves, but it, it, as part of the Prescott general plan, land use plan, I'm sure you have one. It's, in, it's on somebody's shelf somewhere, right? But as part of that, it, it's, it's what's that? It's on the shelf. It strikes me that, that the way to affect that is through zoning changes in the general or regional land use plan. I mean, that's how you, that's how you do that. You, you, you say, here, here's the buffer area. I think you used the word buffer, uh, member good. Here, here's the buffer area where we don't want to see a lot of rooftops because that is going to be where the airport and the commercial operation of the airport is going to have to take place. And if there are starting to be homes, then it's going to limit our ability to be able to maximize the airport. And the only way to do that is zoning. I mean, it's land use planning. That's exactly what you've got. And I don't know if we have looked at that. It's not something that was on the, the list, but it's certainly something that we can include in here. Uh, even if the city has to buy that property and then market it and or condemn that property for the future of movement of our public, we need to look at it seriously. Yeah, you have the, to be a little cautious because sure. of the takings provision. Yeah. Sure, right, but counselor? I mean, practically speaking, with our inclusive zoning, that's the route. It's that and yeah. setting up utilities where you want industrial development and don't put them where you don't. Yeah, and, and, and I would also say that it, uh, along the lines that Councilman Blair was talking, you know, with the original Prop 207, not the marijuana one, the right. diminution and property value one, um, you know, there's, there are challenges to down zoning or because what we know here is that the most, it's sort of different maybe down in Maricopa County, but residential zoning is more valuable than commercial zoning in most places. So when we, if we were to say no homes get to go in, you know, we're going to change the zoning on this without the owner's consent or agreement, we run into a diminution in property value issue and, and we may have to pull out our checkbook. So I think part of it's going to be, the flip side of that is figuring out how you incentivize that, that owner to agree to the down zoning or the change in zoning. So it, it, you know, whether, and again, the legislature has pulled the rug out from under us, both with the Prop 207 and then taking away our ability to do most incentives. You know, gift clause in particular is a challenge. So, I mean, we have to be really, really creative in terms of how do we incentivize and make things happen on private property without just stroking a check. You know, how, how well, how do we get there? And I think that the, the best tool we have that we still have is utility provision. It's not a giveaway. It's the location of what you own, and what we own is water and wastewater. I, I would like to make a suggestion, because this seems like it has been an extremely valuable brief conversation about that, that you allow staff to come up with some language for a strategy for that issue. I, I, don't, want, I don't want to 
I, I don't want to make you micromanage the, the, the language. I'd rather that we let Michael and Tyler and me, you know, go through it and maybe talk to Robin and some other people about how to word it so that we get a strategy in there that's going to accomplish what we just discussed. Everybody okay with that? And I put it down, Tyler, under uh, as, a, as a new bullet point under community asset strategies. And I also put down uh, under the regionalization some form of utilizing established commonalities or existing commonalities or understood commonalities. S Member Sishka, isn't that where you were going? Establish commonalities and so on. Any other, any other discussion? A anything else? The ingress and egress strikes me as one that could be, if, if, if the region had a plan, I, I don't know, maybe we have a plan. Yes, there is. All right, so, so if you were going to do the uh, expansion of ingress and egress there, what, what does the dollar amount look like roughly? Is it a $100 million project? Is it a $200 million? I mean, if you said, I'm looking 10 years down the road when we're going to have, you know, Evian and all the others, all these warehouses and all of these companies because they know they're going to have planes that can come in and out and so on, and Embry-Riddle extends that, that uh, training flight path and so on and so forth. We're going to have all that good stuff, uh, and we're going to need ingress and egress. So looking 10 years down the road, how much is it going to cost us? to uh, uh, build that transportation linkage, that, that road transportation that would provide the necessary ingress and egress. Do you have a ballpark yeah. figure? A bridge over Granite Creek from the east has got to happen if you're going to truly move commerce out of the industrial area. OK, so here, yes, Member Scholl. I have a question for Michael. For our north area plan, do we have someone from ADOT? Part, as part of that? Yeah, he's been participating. I don't know if he's been coming as often as we'd like. Is he? We have been inviting a dot. I mean, that's a challenge with our airport is we're surrounded by state highways. Yeah, you're right. So our egress I mean, it's, it, it, is I, limited. Talked yeah. to Councilman Good the other day that the 89-89A interchange and surrounding area is basically the hub of transportation for Prescott North. And the infrastructure improvements in and around there have to be something the region looks at through organizations like SIMPO. Now, one thing that's come from this morning that I think makes a lot of sense is it's all well and good to have these plans, but for the first time, there's actual money. Yeah. I mean... Right. <laughs> and, and that's... I'm sorry, Michael. That, that, that's where I was going. If, if, if the council is directing the staff to say, come up with a 10-year plan and monetize it, monetize it, so if we're going to build that bridge, if we're going to expand the roads, if we're going to put in this, put in that, what is the dollar necessary for making all those changes with a 10-year look or a five-year look? I mean, I'm trying to be realistic because then you can use those regional commonalities that Member Sishka was talking about and say, would you folks in the surrounding area, knowing that that regional airport and the ingress and egress will help everybody, are you willing to go with us down to the governor and saying, boy, do we have a great idea for a little bit of that money that you're talking about. If we can get DOT to put in X dollars and, the, and you can use some of that federal money to put in X dollars, we can have a, you know, we can take care of a, of a long-term plan that's going to make that more of a regional airport and help the entire state. I mean, it's going to be adding jobs to the state. I mean, the whole state's going to benefit. So, so I think that's... What I'm hearing, you have just told Mike, come up with that plan and see if we can't figure out a way with all that federal infrastructure money to get some of that funding. And I guess we need to put a strategy in there. I have just ingress and egress, but we can talk about it in terms of a... And, and I don't know whether a five-year plan is the right thing. I don't know whether a 10-year plan is the right thing. I'm trying to think about the Center for the Future, and I'm trying to think about, you know, all the things that the, that the airport has potential around it, and as Member Good said, commercialized activities there and so on, and I, I think that, that that whole area would be perfect for a 
regional plan. Additionally, uh, Barry, uh, your yes. comment about uh, a visitor situation rather than a tourist situation is so appropriate because if we get uh, business um, conventions and those kinds of things, they're going to be flying into our airport. That's right. And uh, their, their impression of being able to exit and re-enter when their business is over with is going to have a big impact on their vision of uh, perhaps my business uh, should be located here. So that's so important to not just focus on the tourist visitors, but the potential business relocation um, visitors, either first or second times or whatever. Agreed. Member Rusi? Oh, I'd just like to get back to the annexation issue. Um, and an land use planning. Yes, land, land use okay. planning. Right. But the, the concept with an annexation is it's not about private property rights. An annexation is an invitation to negotiate between the applicant and the city. And the applicant very happily waives his Prop 207 rights by each development agreement includes that waiver. So the city has the tools, they have a charter, the Reasonable Growth Initiative, Prop 400, and we have the tools to negotiate with the developer and these annexations to protect the airport by having a buffer, an industrial zone buffer. And unfortunately, we didn't do that with uh, the master plan with the Deepwell Ranch, or I don't even see it in the, the general plan. And that's something that we can uh, fix if there's a political way, or political will, excuse me. Yeah. I think that having a strategy in there under under the strategies of, of community assets that would deal with zoning and other land use planning activities and utility or some other that we'll have to we'll mm -hmm. have to smooth out the language. I think that all falls, and I think your point is well taken. I think that all kind of gets together. But I, I, I was on the Glendale Zoning and Planning Commission back last century, literally. Okay, and and I happened. That was a good line. It was. Yeah. <laughs> your staff liked it more than mine, though, so I don't know what that's. <laughs> Yeah, they can't laugh too hard because I'm their transportation back to the valley. So, um, no, uh, I, I, I forgot where I was going. <laughs> I was on the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission for the city of Glendale when we zoned uh, Arrowhead Ranch. All right, and I want to tell you that was a bat. What? That was last century. It was. I mean, it was forty. Literally, it was forty years ago, and and. Uh, one of the things that they did, that Glendale did right, okay, was to divide up what was going to be commercial part of, of it and what was going to be residential part and use a lot of the utility avail availability uh, and, and placement. And they had it all as part of a, not just the city's general plan, but there was a regional plan just for our, it was the Arrowhead land use plan. And I think what your migrating to is the adoption of a general airport area, general yeah. zoning plan. Well, it, I, it, and I think that's what we're saying. It needs to be updated, right? Because I... That plan's over 20 years old and it does need to be relooked at because we don't have a crystal ball. So now as you get closer, the, the vision's clear. But I, I mean, 20 years, if that plan was 20 years ago, how many, how many uh, uh, commercial flights were coming in here 20 years ago? Maybe one, one. Maybe okay, one. Well, and, and and some guy who was lost, you know, because marijuana wasn't legal then, and, and, he and, was, and, and, and em, Ember Riddle has tripled in size with their overhead flights. Yeah. Since then, so. uh, by the way, I need to do a full disclosure here. I have been contracted by Embry Riddle to work with them on some of their expansion things, and I, I did. Congratulations. Clear that. No, I thank think you. That, yeah, I did I clear that, that with the manager yeah. before I signed the contract. No, I think there's tremendous synergies with yeah. you working for both of us. I don't think there's a conflict. And, and yeah. Robin, maybe if it works out well, Robin can take credit for it. If it doesn't, I'm coming after you. You know. <laughs> uh, but I mean, there are certain things. You know, and here's another 
commonality. I, I, I really like the more I think about it, the more I like that word. There, there's a commonality with them because they have uh, they have money allocated to use as one-to-one -one matching funds. Now that doesn't usually happen when you walk into the legislature and say, "Would you please give me some some state general fund money or some federal money?" We're willing to go one-on-one. -on -one. I'm working for Apache County on a road. I've been working on it for years, and and they're asking for. 900,000, and they're willing to match it, put in 400,000. Legislature thought that was terrific. You're going to put in $400,000 county money for a, a road. Now, it's still a battle, and we haven't gotten it yet, but the point is when you come in with one to one matching funds, and then the city all of a sudden says there's a benefit, maybe the city can sweeten the pot just a little bit from our economic development funding opportunities then all of a sudden you've got a very, very uh, synergistic plan, and that requires updating that plan. I agree with Member Blair. I, I think you need to look at that plan and update it, because I think if it was written 20 years ago, it had none of the opportunities that I think we have now, and I think now we can probably see 10 years into the future. Uh, and I don't want to step on any toes, Robin, but I think that's, I think that's the way to do it. So I think that adding um, the uh, uh, zoning and other land use and utility planning and so on, and even you can add a car area, especially as related to the airport area, would probably be appropriate. Any other comments on the economic? We made some good changes here, folks. And, and again, none of these are my ideas. This is what I took from the emails that Tyler kept sending me about thoughts that you folks had that wanted to be included. All right, let's move to quality of life. We're making great progress. Our goal of getting done before lunch is, is doable. Um, let, me, let me touch, did somebody say good? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, let me touch on something one member talked about, and I think it's a strategy, and I think it is promoting vaccination. Um, and I think you can certainly include that as a strategy under quality of life uh, op objective number four, where it talks about promoting well-being and enhance a vibrant community. Uh, I think you could add promoting uh, broad vaccination utilization or broad delivery of vaccinations to the public. B Barry, can I? Yeah, go I, ahead, Michael. I hate to go backwards because I know we could get bogged down in something, but I, you know, I provided some growth and development data also as a supplement. Oh, I, you know, I apologize. I no, saw that okay. document. Go um, ahead, please. It's appropriate. I just think this now. is really a big issue from a staff perspective as we try to get our arms around what this elected body feels like is a sustainable, moderate growth rate, and are we acting as a staff to bring that to fruition? I, um, and the reason I brought this data is to give it some context. And I, you guys all have this in front of you that, uh, you know, when we talk about regionalism and working with our partners um, on growth and development, I think it's, yes, ma'am. Um, do you have that paper somewhere? Yeah. I think it's in that it stack right there. Oh, in this stack? It's underneath, yeah. Oh, underneath. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, basically, just to give everybody a little context, and I, I've showed this to a couple of you in the past few days. I've got the document up there. Um, yeah, I think it really brings and it kind of hit home to me about the growth in Western Yavapai County and what percentage of that we're absorbing or doing um, when we talk about, you know, what's the sustainable, what's reasonable, what makes sense. Um, I bring your attention to the first page that, you know, the city of Prescott's overall growth from 1990 to present is 66% or has been about 2.2% a year. Um, to start at the macro level, um, since 1990, Arizona's grown at a rate of 3.2% a year, or a growth of 97%. And then as you go down to the other surrounding jurisdictions, you look at Prescott Valley that's gone from a population of just under 9,000 to a population of almost 
49,000 and has grown at a rate of 450%. And even Chino has grown um, from 4,800 people to almost 13,000 people and has grown at 169%. And uh, Tyler really tried to get the unincorporated county, but that that is not really available. But when you look at the county, that it's grown at 4.1% since 1990 and has grown 123%. Um, what does this elected body think is a reasonable growth rate for this muni municipality when you look at the region and the state and our surrounding jurisdictions? I think it follows the general plan exactly as it was written. And I, I think this brings larger context to a struggle of trying to moderate growth in this jurisdiction when surrounding jurisdictions are growing at rates or that are exponentially higher, and the state of Arizona is growing at a rate that's exponentially higher. And then I brought data from every period of time, 2000, 2005, to 2010 to present, in each instance, the trend I'm talking about continues. So what is the expectation of this council, and how would you like us as a staff to strategize to make that happen? We always yeah. talk about market dictating the growth, and at the present time, we're at what we talked about in the general plan, and the market's dictating the growth right now based upon uh, growth, they can't get the employees, they can't get the product, and right now, Dorn and Mandalay Homes are only allowing their salespeople to sell one home a week. That's minimizing the growth, but the problem is, you go out there and look, every one of those houses, lots are sold. They're not going away, we can't build an invisible wall around Prescott, and it's gonna develop. So, I think we've been doing it the right way. We haven't outstripped our infrastructure, water or sewer, we're way underneath our, our total volume that we can pump every year. I don't know what it is that we need to change any more than what we're doing right now. Yes, both, both prior to and since joining the council, I've, I've heard uh, in the community this council characterized over the last several years as, as pro-growth. I'm not sure any individual on the council would label themselves that way. But if in fact that's the case, we're doing a really poor job according to the state. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, good point, uh, I, I, but, but I, think it, it, I think it's relative <coughs> also. I, I mean, if you're comparing Prescott to Prescott Valley, we're doing a lousy job, but I think there might be some people in Prescott Valley who said the explosion is untenable, we can't, we can't continue to facilitate what is Certainly. needed by the growth that's, uh, that is occurring. Well, I would agree with you for sure. And Prescott Valley is probably an anomaly that way, but, but we're talking about the entire I of the Avapai sure. County and, and our, our uh, neighboring cities, and we're well below that. Now, I, I think the other thing that's really important for me is this runs on a parallel track to water. It does, yeah. So, <laughs> again, if we're not gonna be a regional player, this is all gonna happen around us. And is that really a direction we want to go? And I, I don't think it is, but there's ramifications of it not being, and I think that that needs I, to be clarified. I think right. I have heard the council, and then uh, Member Roosing is next, uh, I think I've heard the council say, no, we can't, we have to be a regional participant because what happens around us, especially in areas of infrastructure, is definitely going to affect us. Member Roosing? Um, I just would like to make a comment, uh, since we're on quality of life, um, Mr. Um, Blair touched upon outstripping our infrastructure, and it's very important that we as a community, as a city, we don't let that happen, because that will affect our quality of life. So we need to keep up with our growth sustainably and manage, and manage it by keeping up with our infrastructure and our amenities, uh, such as parks, trails, open space, uh, library. Those are, I consider that part of our infrastructure too, that we provide to uh, keep our quality of life to such a high level that we have. Thank you. And, and yes, Mayor? Barry, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mayor, and then uh, Mr. Sishka, did you want to also? Yeah, I'll come. I, okay. I always have a comment. All right. We were talking about regionalization earlier, and, and, yes. and you know, I was talking about influence. And if we manage water the best in the region, and we do, 
we conserve it the best, we, we recharge it the best. So then why wouldn't we want to be the leader and annex and use our resources to best preserve the AMA? Um, and so I, I just think we have to get ahead of this growth. And you talk about growth coming in around us. Do we want that or do we want to control it? And I think that's the question before this group. Uh, when we can, we should control how water is used because we do it the best to preserve the AMA, uh, our aquifer, long term. Uh, you know, we've talked about annexations. And we've talked about keeping up with infrastructure. Well, the way you do that is to... One of the ways you do that is through annexation with impact fees. You know, it, it's, it's not like we can just come up with this money to improve our infrastructure if we don't have a way to fund that improved infrastructure. So I know that people don't like the word annexation. Oh my gosh, you're getting bigger, you're just grabbing land. But the truth of the matter is, there are a hell of a lot of benefits, if done right, to annexations. Let, let's make sure we're talking about the, the, the term we're talking about we all agree to. When I consider annexation, I consider taking land that is not currently within the boundaries of the city of Prescott and annexing it in. Is that what you're talking about? That's exactly right. Okay. Because you used the word annexation, and I think we were referring to something different with that, and that was annexing area that's within the city of Prescott, but that we're there, we wanted to change how that developed. Is that correct? No, I was talking yeah. about annexations in general. Oh, okay. And, and All right. And thank you for clarifying yeah. that. And also, I'd like to just throw out that I wasn't aware of recently is that Yavapai County is the fourth most populous county in the state. It's ahead of Coconino. And uh, I was... Uh, unaware of that, but uh, now that I'm aware of that, I, I realize that uh, we are definitely um, um, being uh, under a lot, lot more pressure, I think, than I realized as far as growth, and that's why we need to have these conversations. Mr. Good? Well, you can talk about percentage uh, increases um, and be able to uh, cherry pick uh, the net of uh, growth, whether this uh, analysis at 2.2 percent, um, but if you don't have good planning, 2.2 percent can be horribly um, um, negative on the impact of quality of life. Um, if you have good planning, you can manage that growth so it doesn't have a, a serious negative impact on the community at large. When you're dealing with a, a community that has a uh, average age of, you know, 56 or 57, then you have to even talk about net growth because you're going to be uh, losing some people and um, replacing those with a net growth population. And if it's all uh, residential development, we don't know if those people are going to be considered um, uh, long-term permanent users, whether um, those uh, residential facilities are being leased out uh, for people um, that are um, working or, or trying to work or create a workforce. So in my opinion, one to two percent that's properly planned um, is something that can be absorbed and we can use our water uh, allocation to be able to manage that in an effective manner. I mean, Michael and I have had conversations going back over uh, four years where I was saying, I'd like to see your most re uh, recent reasonable uh, traffic study. Well, we never did a, a, a broad term traffic study. And the costs that we looked at to even trying to create one were kind of beyond our um, uh, general fund resources. Uh, but now with some additional uh, revenue, we can uh, start to actually do a study so that we can plan in advance for the impacts and not try to figure out how to 
um, deal with them after the fact because some of this really broad uh, residential development is creating such a negative impact that uh, trying to fix it after the fact is just not going to be uh, possible to do it in a positive way. So I think um, one to two percent that's properly planned is the kind of uh, growth that is not going to have a real negative impact on the community and the quality of life. So that has to be done. And um, you know we're seeing, seeing the uh, residential growth while at the same time we're trying to get some uh, traffic study and planning in effect. And unless it comes forward pretty rapidly, um, we're not going to be able to make the changes uh, or make the plans that are going to be able to reduce the impact that every single person in this community sees on almost a daily basis. And Michelle. Thanks, Barry. I agree with most of what Mr. Good said. I think where I struggle with wanting to control our growth or, or plan more accordingly is that we don't live in a silo. The growth that happens in Prescott Valley, the growth that happens in Chino in the unincorporated area is going to affect our traffic, is going to affect how many people are coming in and using our services. So just to plan for Prescott and not to include the growth that happens elsewhere and to include that, that growth into our plans, I think, is, is not self-serving. It's going to, to not be a good long-term plan. So I think... I think there's real benefit to talking about what's happening elsewhere and talking about serving water outside the city limits or um, annexations. I think that this is a broader context to just what's happening in Prescott. I think the last two comments validate where you went as a council about an hour ago, and that is recognizing the commonalities, to use a member Thiska's term, and the regionalization and having the vision and being able to take a leadership role in doing it, because I'd rather be on the front of the train and have people you know, backbiting me if I'm doing the right thing than to be in the back of the train and having to just go along and maybe not in our best interest. So I think what you've done, and I think the changes that you've made and the updates made and the, the more encompassing you've made some of your objectives, I think the better off you are to accomplish what, what I just heard all of you say. So, Barry, yes. May I yes. Hi, Barry. I'm Bryn Stotler, the Director of Community Development. Yes. I just wanted to comment for the council that Prescott Valley, where nobody used the mic. <clears throat> if you yeah. don't use the microphone, the guy in the back who's wearing a mask as a chin strap is going to beat you, beat you up. Right. That's right. Very good. Uh, thanks, Barry. I'm Bryn Stoller, Director of Community Development, and I wanted to just alert the council and do sort of dovetails off of this aspect that both Prescott Valley and Yavapai County have, and I think Chino Valley also, have initiated their updates of their either comprehensive or their general plans, and we're right behind them. So we're at a point with regional planning where we always check in with each other, our development departments, and align our planning process along the boundaries of our communities. So that is something that's gonna be evolving over the next two to three years. They'll start their plans this year, probably have completed plans in a year or a year and a half. We'll start a planning process for to the update to our general plan also probably within about 18 months. Do we have a organization here similar to what we have in Phoenix in MAG? Yes. In we PAG, what, what is it Simpo, called? SIMPO, Central Yavapai Metropolitan Planning yeah. Organization. Yeah. I, one of the, and I think that's a great comment because one of the things that led to MAG's growth as kind of a regional planning, they can't enforce anything but a regional planning, was the fact that some of the cities that were expanding and putting, you know, you had warehouse, well, I'll tell you the biggest one is, and there's legislation this year that just passed, was agricultural nuisance, mm -hmm. where you had a, a livestock facility on one side of the city border and you had major residential on the other side and guess what? It caused an agricultural nuisance. So I'm glad to hear that you have that. Thank you. That was not a fun bill to negotiate, by the way. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Good. You know, Barry, uh, you, Barry, I know that the counties that exceed 250,000 in population have a different uh, status within the uh, legislature. So if we're right now at about 240,000, and we're growing at 4% a year on the county, uh, we're gonna be into that new category within a year. Can you comment on what that might uh, change as far as 
uh, county planning and its impact on Prescott and our surrounding communities? Well, the first thing that it might change is that y you may go to merit selection of judges. Isn't 250 the threshold? Um, which, quite frankly, and I'm biased. I'm a member of the Maricopa County Judicial Selection Commission. I will tell you that the, that the merit selection has produced an incredibly efficient and effective court system. Uh, Pima County has it, Pinal County has it, Calcanino just chose to do it voluntarily because uh, I was on the training team that went up to help them uh, get kind of kicked off. So that's one thing. You're going to meet certain thresholds of that. Um, you're going to meet certain thresholds where you're going to fall out of the coveted status of small county. And the reason I say coveted status is they tend to provide some uh, financial benefits to some of the truly small counties. Like I said before, I represent Apache and Greenlee. So, you know, we get lottery money. I don't think you get lottery money anymore. I think you're one of the five counties that got cut out. There are other facets like that. I think it would be a good idea uh, for us, the collective us, to take a look at what the implications are. It's a really, really good point because it may have positive benefits and it may lose us some things that we have benefited by being a quote unquote small county. But I will tell you, merit selection, that's one of the really, really good benefits that you're going to get. You will not be electing your judges anymore. Um, Barry, I, along the lines that were discussed, uh, Councilmember Scholl and others, uh, I guess, and uh, to, to Michael's data here, I, I, <coughs> is it important that the council, I guess, agree or discuss that that Prescott's growth rate is generally going to be lower in whatever category than elsewhere. Um, and is there a corollary or even a cause and effect that if it's more difficult in Prescott to grow, then that growth is going to go elsewhere? Uh, you, you know, so is there, is there a willingness or to, to discuss or even acknowledge that if it's harder to grow here, the growth is coming anyway, and the more challenges you have in growing in Prescott or growing you know, just percentage-wise, that, that's why the growth is higher elsewhere. I would simplify it by saying growth will occur where growth can occur. I, but again, I think, if the, does the council agree with that? Because I think to, to Councilwoman Scholl's point that the stovepiping or this island concept that, well, we could just make it hard to grow here, um, and therefore things will be fine, or does it just create growth outside of the city and, and cause traffic problems or cause air pollution problems or cause whatever problem you, people see with growth? I, mean, it, it, I, I agree with that. I think to Bryn's point, thank you for bringing it up, um, you're, you're talking about different types of growth. That was a strict population growth data, uh, all right? And, and that is one element of growth. And another element of growth is what your general plan and your regional plans will allow you if all of a sudden you are allowed to have more vertical properties, you can increase growth because you can add more people as you go up into the air. And I, I got to tell you, I'm constantly amazed at how many apartment complexes are exploding in Phoenix. I don't know where all these people are coming from except that I understand that people in a certain age group tend to move every two years. So they're looking for a brand new apartment to move to because they just trashed the one they were living in. Um, that, that's truer than you, than you can think. So I think in the general plan, if, if we're updating the general plan and we're also updating some of the uh, plans within that general plan, like the airport area and so on and so forth, I think that's where those decisions are going to have to be made. It's a, it's a good point. Yeah, Mr. Blair. But in all fairness, you know, I remember when the supervisors were laughed at and the city was laughed at in the expansion of our road system, putting in Fane Road when it was two lanes and now it's four lanes, putting in, you know, <laughs> Glassford Hill Road and putting in all these different infrastructures, the parkway that goes, and everybody says, well, why did you build that? There's only two cars on there. Well, look at it today. That's not true. So there's been a lot of foresight. You know, when you look at Willow Creek Road in my time, it was a two-lane dirt road. Well, okay, we've changed that. 
lot of things we've changed as we've evolved based upon the population base. And I think it's important to know that those things have to happen and they will continue to happen. When I was in Tempe, I'm not as old as you, thank goodness, but, um, <laughs> when, 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 you know, I remember, I remember sitting at a Tempe city council meeting back in the day and they made the comment back in 1979 that Tempe was never going to grow unless they went up straight up. Well, guess where they are today? When you look down there, you have sky rises, as straight you mentioned, up. Yeah. everywhere they go because they're landlocked. So we can get landlocked here and tell people we're out of room, but guess what's going to happen? We're going to change those values and we're going to go up with the same infrastructure. So my point is, is Tempe still got the same infrastructure they had 45, 50 years ago. And they probably have quadrupled the population. There's some things that you can change and some things you cannot. And, and those will occur over time, but it's why I'll get to Member Shaw, I saw your hand. It, it's why when we're talking about ingress and egress at the airport, and by the way, I know, as somebody from Maricopa, that sometimes it's faster to go up Fain Road and come all the way around sure. to get to City Hall than to stop at every stoplight, uh, unless I want to stop at the Dairy Queen, yeah. which is another matter there. But that's why I said, with the ingress and, and egress, that, that you've got to say to yourself, what do we want that to look like 10 years from now? Because there may only be... You know what? I don't know what the number is, but 76 cars per hour per mile or something. I don't know what those that data is, but today, but we've got a plan for it to be maybe a thousand cars per mile per per hour and so on, because there will be so much activity there, and 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 that's part of the planning process, which is which, which you have now ensconced in this in this plan. You've told the staff that you really need to do that, and then it's gonna be a matter of whether it can get done. Member Scholl. Well, I was just gonna add that I think our recent decision to only allow ductile iron pipe will be an important part of keeping our infrastructure costs down moving into the future as we, as we support new growth. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that was a smart move. Let, let me, that's a good point. Let, let me start, um, it's, it's 11 o'clock, our goal is to kind of wind up by 11.30, which is when I understand food is coming in. And the one thing that I have learned is you never stand between a group and its food. Um, one of the things that came up that I think we should include uh, was related to me is the regional establishment of a regional park. And, and I think that's probably appropriate under goal three, objective one, and that is, or, or three, um, by the way, I would note that the 2020 plan had as one of the tactics the Hilton Garden project. Do you notice that on the bottom of that page? Congratulations, folks. You put it in as a tactic and it worked. I mean, that's what this plan is all about. I mean, going back and saying, yeah, hey, wow, we talked about the Hilton Garden project and it's here. That's where we are right now. So that's a good sign. But I would suggest, and I, I think it was Member Roosing who made that recommendation in, in your in the documents I got from you, that that uh, that should either be, and I would ask you to leave it to us to make the determination as to where we should slot it in, but it definitely should be a strategy under either objective, uh, goal three, objective one, or goal three, objective three, just depending upon where we think it's more appropriate to slot it in. Anything else under the quality of life before we get into uh, goal four? I've got a question. Yes, this, sir. This is for future discussion, not for today, but... How many uh, municipalities, particularly in Arizona, are you aware of over 10,000 people that don't have a municipal swimming pool? Cottonwood has one, PV has one, Chino Valley has one, Wickenburg, Sedona, Flagstaff, and even Camp Verde have one. We're the only municipality of, of any size in Yavapai County that doesn't. Do you know of others in Arizona that don't? Uh, no, I don't know that. That's an interesting data question to ask, but I don't know the answer to that. Uh, did you say over 10,000 population? 10, yeah, one, one fourth of our size, less than one fourth of our size. Everyone has one. It, wow, it, yeah. I, and, and that's the type of thing that I would suggest that under quality of life would be something that you recommend to the staff that they put in as a tactic, and that is investigating the feasibility of providing a, a municipal pool in the city. I've got a splash pad out here. 
That's close enough, right? <laughs> we, we've Does invested that, heavily. Uh, we've invested heavily in recreational amenities that that meet the needs of people. 30 and over, which is absolutely as it should be. I love that. But I'd like to see us at least explore the possibility of some additional managers yeah. that would meet people. I, in. I would recommend that, unless there's any objection from the other members, that you that we refer to staff utilizing uh, that as a tactic within one of the strategies of uh, quality of life, and that is to investigate the feasibility of of yeah, a municipal I, I would pool. like to, if we're going to have that dialogue too, Councilman Tenney, is to see if there's a lot of interest in that sure. from the rest of yes. the council. Um, yeah. In my last community, we built a regional pool. It was an indoor facility, and it worked out very well. But there are places where you go down that path, and right. it doesn't. And it would be interesting to know how much political will there is in that regard. It's this is a place, so I think we probably have fallen down, and I agree with Clark, that during the development phase of, like, Deep Well Ranch is to and they initiate a private public conversation with them to where they donate the land or the case or build the pool where we manage it. And we haven't done that because we haven't thought far enough out to do that. But I don't think the time's dead to do that. I think that opportunity still exists. So, And, and that could be a facet of a... Uh, uh, of an investigation, a feasibility investigation of a pool. So that's a, that's a good, that's an interesting question. I, I don't yeah. know the uh, answer I agree to with that. Michael, 100. percent That shouldn't be driven by one person. So Ron yeah. James, right. uh, whether people like him or don't like him, his daughter was an avid swimmer, and he put a million dollars towards the YMCA and their swimming pool. So if he's broached with the idea of a community pool out at his development, he may be very keen to that. Is there any objection to make it, to allowing the staff to put in a tactic of looking into the feasibility of a municipal pool? No, I, I want to thank I, Mr. Tenney. He's our newest uh, council I, I know, member, right? and uh, new he's eyes, definitely new, uh, got some ideas. Thank you. You know, fresh eyes on the plan is what we always need. I mean, this is, I remind you folks, this document is an organic document. I, I don't know why, but when you just made that comment, what popped into my head was the Jamaican bobsled team. <laughs> it, it's, it's a true story. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen the yes. movie, but it's a true story. It was a Jamaican cool bobsled running. team. What? Cool running. Cool running. That's yes, right. That's right. Did you have another comment, Member Scholl? Yeah. I want to um, just revisit our regional park idea. I mean, I, I think that's been a goal of this council for a long time, is to secure land in the Dells and make it really an accessible area for everyone. But it, at this point, to me, it doesn't feel very regional. It feels like the city of Prescott has been doing all the heavy lifting and acquiring of the land. So if it's going to be a regional park, I, I would appreciate regional buy-in. And I don't know what that looks like at this point, but just something else to think about is how do we make this more of a partnership? Because it will be not just benefit the city of Prescott, it will benefit Western Yampa County. Well, well, on that note, yes, I Mayor. have reached out to Chairman Craig Brown uh, and uh, asked him to consider meeting and looking at ways the county can get involved with a purchase of Glassford Hill, with a regional trail over to Jerome, uh, partnering with us on the uh, environmental library that we're hoping to get done if we get the annexation done. And so I think there are ways, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, that uh, we need to bring the county and Prescott Valley in and allow them the opportunity to participate with us uh, in a regional park. Because I think previous councils have done a good job of pre preserving open space and the lakes, et cetera, that you guys have done. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I, I intend to follow up with Chairman Brown. I sent him a letter, uh, I think it was last week, uh, in that regard. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with putting a, a concept in two places. And I think we have it in one place with regard to um, quality of life, I think we could also add it where we made that addition of sewer, water, transportation, infrastructure, and, uh, and, and parks and recreation. I think we could regionalization, right? Yeah, that, that word always bugs me when you don't have regional partners. But I, I will have to say, I've worked for the last five years and with Joe Baines coming on as park director. Uh, it's changed, and we've had many meetings with the state parks director as well as state land department. And we have some pretty good ideas of what's been going on out there. The state may be looking at helping us 
do a state mm -hmm. park. There's some resistance on some people's factors that they lose control in the state of area or in, in the city, but the state has assured me that if they went any further at looking at it, that they would be part of the funding as a mechanism of the state park, but the city of Prescott would operate it. And I've also talked with Chairman Brown. He agreed to, if we went that direction of combining, well, hopefully we get in the future, that they would look at funding a full-time position from the county level for maintenance. So there's a lot of things I've worked on behind the scenes. I don't bring them out because everybody seems to want to get involved in them. And then, sure. the, whole, then the whole thing gets murkied up, muddied up, and then everybody wants to back away. So I think you, you take small steps, you deal with the elements you have to deal with, and eventually it'll get there, yep. but we can't push it. I think, but having it as, and I think that's a great point, having it as an objective in both places, though, allows that to be told mm -hmm. to the staff so they now know that's what the council wants. They want to look at it on both levels as both a quality of life as well as an economic development application. Okay, I think that was a good addition. Yes, sir. I just had a comment. Yes, sir. I don't think my bottom line is I don't think we can artificially stop growth. The key is what do things look like once we've grown? And and that's what we're talking about today. And that that is perfectly dovetail with what we were just talking about with taking a long-term look with regard to the regional plan or general plan. Um, and, and, but but I, war I want to warn you, editorial comment folks, be real careful that that plan doesn't have an element of flexibility in it. Because when, when, when things are blocked that are new good ideas because they don't fit within the plan, that's where you get a dynamic tension that causes problems. So you've got to include a certain element of flexibility because while we can judge what's going to exist 10 years down the road, all right, and I'm, not, I'm looking at you, Brent, only because you're the one that's, that's your area, but if you're looking at that 10 years down the road, you don't know what detour might occur, what opportunity might come up. We might say, oh, wow, like, you know, we may, so we, we have to deviate a little bit from the plan. Well, we never even saw three years ago or four years ago what the airport was going to look like today. No, I appreciate that. That's exactly correct. And, and that has driven us to do some other things. Did you have your hand up? Well, no, just this here. Yeah. Two years ago, we didn't know this was going to sit here, but look what we have today. Yeah, I, yeah, I remind you that there is a tactic on page quality three, tactic, Hilton Garden Project. I, I mean, it, there was forethought there. I don't know when we put that tactic in originally, whether it was 2019 or 2020, but yeah, We have a saying in the South is even the sun shines on a dog's every once in a while. Yes, well, yeah. that's true. That's what I, happened. On my, ver <laughs> my, version of, my version of that is even a blind squirrel stumbles yeah, over an acorn every that, once yeah. in a while. Yeah, same thing. Other comment on that? Before I move to, we're, we're making progress. Before I move to uh, goal four, which is, uh, and by the way, I just want to remind everybody that we did include, and we'll figure out how to, how to wordsmith it, but under, under goal three, objective four, promoting well-being, we have put in a uh, promotion of the vaccination as a strategy. All right. So goal, somebody yelled, hooray, I thought I heard. Goal four is service-oriented culture. I did not get any comments in the papers that were delivered to me that came from any members of the council for any additions or corrections. I will tell you, we worked really hard the last time we did this on objective one and strategy four, the, the shared vision culture. You'll even notice that it, that shared vision is emboldened, and I think that's how important we thought it was. Are, are there any additional Yes, I'd just Mr. Like to Sishka. change a word. Yeah. Where it says customer service feedback. Where are change you, please? On, uh, Is strategies. it strategy one? First Second bullet. bullet point. Second bullet. Change service to customer experience uh, feedback. Any objection? Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've noticed when I get these, every time I buy something on the internet or do something on the internet, I am besieged for the next 
five weeks. Could you please tell us about your experience? So thank you. I think that brings us more up to date. Mr. Tenney, yes, quick, sir. Quick question. In this area, uh, there was an article in the paper just the other day about uh, a possible shift in um, facilities for City Hall. And I wonder if either maybe Greg or Michael wanted to comment on that briefly on how this could impact our customer experience or people who deal well, with the city. The one customer and I, one industry that really is going to see a lot of benefit is the industry that does construction. Um, one of the areas that I think the facilities have been a weak point in terms of efficiencies and effectiveness, and this isn't about people, it's about physical proximity, is the building services and getting in and out of the building. Because right now, you're coming downtown and then you're going to Virginia Street and there's a complete disconnect um, physically about those locations. We've done things around the margins to try to make that better with moving people around, but having those two things uh, in the same building is going to be really quite seamless. Also, I think, and I've had this conversation, when departments have a lot of interaction on a day-to-day -day basis, and I mean like to try to get a customer to completion, physically being around one another, even when there is not a customer, improves the level of cooperation and collaboration. I think we're going to have, you know, one of the things Joe and I've talked about is that we're kind of going into this new facility with we want to put the people close to one another that work close to one another because you just get a better product. I don't know if the mayor has anything to add to that. But. Yeah, I think, uh, Councilman Tenney, this is the number one reason why we would move into this new building. I think uh, for, for those that interact with us, we don't, we don't have a facility that's friendly. Uh, when you look at the front door, uh, it, you park in the back, or maybe on the street, but you park in the back and then you're, I see people walking around trying to figure out where do I go? I see people in line at times over at legal or they're trying to figure out, do I go to this little building here or do I go to the main? And so uh, there's a lot of problems with our facility in terms of being welcoming and friendly and user friendly. And so to have a large parking lot and then it's obvious where I'm going to the front door, so to speak. Uh, I just think service delivery is gonna be a lot better. Uh, and I think, you know, we take pride in our city. We, we love our city. We think it's a, a jewel, so to speak. Yet our city hall, as Mayor Pro Tem has said a few different times, does not say that. And I think this building does. And so I, I hope that our employees uh, feel better about where they work and who they work for when we have a facility that exudes uh, excellence. Great. So that opportunity might dovetail nicely yes. with, with this uh, goal area. Yes. Do you, should we add that um, as, as one of the strategies, the uh, implementation of the, um, I don't know how to word it, Michael, help me. Uh, uh, city facility co-location and service there you improvements. Go. There I just said. City, loca city facilities co-location. I think that would be a good strategy, and thank you for bringing that up. I have a question for all of you, and, th and this is, how many of you think that the change that was caused by the pandemic to virtual uh, engagement is going to continue after the pandemic is officially over, which will probably be about another, don't hit me, about another year. And there's a reason I say that. Um, and, and that we're going to continue. I'm, I'm just curious, because you are civic leaders, and I, I, you know, I, I worry about this. I'm in the relationship business, folks. I'm a lobbyist. And I've had a miserable year this year because I can't visit with anybody. It's really, been, it's really been difficult. By the way, the reason I say a year, I have fraternity brother who is a medical researcher at UNC Chapel Hill who works with epidemiologists and pathologists, and they say that a, a corona-type virus, think SARS, think MERS, thinks COVID-19, has a mutation cycle of somewhere between 18 months and two years. We are into the second year now, that's why I say we're probably still looking at another nine to 12 months before it's quote unquote officially over, unless Washington DC decides they got a good thing and they're gonna keep it going. Um, 
Very that accurate. was a cynical editorial comment. I guarantee you we wouldn't have gotten the input that we've gotten today if we were on Zoom. Oh, you wouldn't have gotten me to lead the discussion if we were on Zoom because it wouldn't have been as free-flowing. It is so difficult. It is so difficult to conduct, I call this a green light or brainstorming session, which is what it was. And we, we bounce back and forth, and it's so much easier to do that uh, when you're in person. Um, but I fear that a lot of entities, not public, private, are going to continue to use virtual format because they're going to decide that either one, they're too lazy to go in person, or number two, it's so much cheaper not to do it in person. Well, I think. It's going to be a mixed bag. So I think this is definitely 3D being in the room together. That's the most ideal. Yes. Yet uh, with meetings happening in the afternoons or at maybe inconvenient times for people who want to participate, we will continue to offer the opportunity to participate virtually uh, because people can then be productive at work and then jump into an agenda and comment uh, so it's just a, a way to get even more public engagement, I feel like, to continue that. Uh, while it's not as ideal for some, uh, it's very convenient. And so we want to keep that opportunity open for those that, that want to use it. We're going to have to learn better skills at doing that if that's going to continue. I agree. I happen to agree with you, Mayor. We're going to have to learn better skills. Uh, uh, Senator Otondo uh, decided at the beginning of session that she was going to vote on the floor from her office through, through Zoom, which is allowed. And of course, while she's on it, she is, you know, she's supposed to mute until it's time for her to actually vote. There are two or three others who are doing that. You hear some really interesting conversations that they're conducting when they realize they haven't muted themselves, okay? Michelle? Well, I think there's a level of productivity that comes with virtual platforms. I will tell you as a working person myself, I'm able to get much more done when I don't have to drive to a meeting, park, walk in, sit down, then leave, go back to my office. I can jump on a meeting at two, be done at three, and then keep going with my day. So I. I think there's a piece that can stay in terms of staff working together, and I don't know, I don't think there's any interest in this body or other commissions meeting virtually for in perpetuity, but I think there's a, a productivity piece that comes with virtual platforms. I, I admire your energy. When you're my age, you won't be able to do that, trust me. I, some people have commented that it, it, it is an age thing. Okay, that the younger people are able to go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. I will tell you that, that there are some circumstances where having time between meetings when I'm driving from the office to the Capitol is a rejuvenation time for me. Now again, that, that, that different people work at different ways and so on. I think the mayor's right, I think you're right. I think we will continue to have utilization of virtual platform well, ahead. And for regionalization, I mean, meeting with people who are down in the valley or all over That's on a moment's notice is really helpful That's instead of having point. to physically be together. Yep. Yep. Let's see. I think Mr. Hey, Sifka and then Ms. Rosen. You know, we're talking about the new city hall, and we've got had some conversations about how big do we build the council chambers. What I'm wondering is, I believe that the Zoom factor has given a lot more people access to our forum. My question is, if in fact that's the case, do we build this gigantic cavernous council chamber in an age where people are getting more and more comfortable with participating, at least listening and making a comment every once in a while about uh, to, you know, in an age where we may not need the butts in the seats. Well, so, what if you do but make it a multi-purpose space? So with the idea of co-working and not everyone needing an office, but rather just needing a table and a laptop, you can use this council chambers for multiple functions so that when it isn't a planning and zoning or isn't a council meeting, we can use that space and it's not dead space. Yeah, and those are the kind of questions that are real interesting about what you're talking about. And, and that's why I raised it, because it is going to color some of the physical amenity 
decisions that the staff has to make in terms of application. I'll throw another, and I'll get to you in just a second. I, I'll throw another uh, confusing point of this. We are very, very close to holographic representation. All right? You may be in a Zoom meet, well, a virtual meeting where when people are looking, they are seeing you sitting in your seats three dimensionally, but you're not physically there. So you can attend a council meeting after you die? <laughs> <laughs> One of the organizations I represent is Alcor, which is the largest cryonics firm. And if you do that to me again, you're going to be in a doer at two, 315 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I just wanted to comment Maybe is the answer. that with the, the uh, pandemic, online shopping has exploded. Yeah. Uh, people ordering toilet paper online. And um, I don't think that's going to change. I think people are still going to be shopping online a lot more than they used to because they've gotten used to the system and the home delivery. So we need to be aware of that. It, which is why the decision last year that the legislature made to allow the state and political subdivisions to access sales tax. What was the name of the Wayfair, the Wayfair, Wayfair decision? You know, but, yeah. but there's also a good point, you're going back, sort of circling back to the growth issue, because we talk about competition between, you know, we have a Costco, so people got to come here to go to Costco. But if, if somebody, whatever zip code you're in, by way of Wayfair, if I buy Costco online and I'm in Prescott Valley, that sales tax, you know, it, it, it's, you know, when I buy something online, it's the sales tax charge goes to that municipality. Right. So, you know, because you're buying from a warehouse somewhere. Right. So the, there is, you know, the advantage of, of growth or one of the advantages of growth is that as if people are buying online and that's increasing in Prescott and you have a Prescott zip code, our, our online sales tax numbers are incredible. That's a perfect um, example of why you need to annex, because the annex, if they stay in the county and they order online, the city of Prescott doesn't get any sales tax. Bingo. Mr. Good. Well, I think uh, we could probably expect some type of a uh, variation or a hybrid uh, future where it comes to uh, representation and public participation. I think there's no question there will be a, a, almost a permanent reduction in brick and mortar and in-person uh, business meetings or, or um, Sorry, parts of the private sector working from that perspective, too. I know m my wife, for a uh, number of years, worked for Disney Corporation and had to fight like hell to be able to get approval f to do some telecommuting because the uh, commute was just so brutal um, and finally was able to get that done. But um, I think in the broader perspective, we're seeing um, many uh, major businesses downsizing their brick and mortar now and realizing they can continue to grow their business effectively uh, in some of these uh, Zoom or remote uh, concepts. Uh, but we're you know, making a decision now on uh, relocating our city hall and being able to provide a uh, good customer experience. So having some flexibility to find out what the Few, the true future is going to uh, look like, it's difficult to make a projection from where we are right now. I mean, you can take this room, for example. You've got this uh, flexibility to be able to expand it or contract it. Right. And having that type of flexible planning in our future city hall, I think, is uh, important so that if it does turn out that uh, the community or the the citizens want to be able to be physically uh, in a room to watch uh, government decisions being made, we have that ability. Or we can increase public awareness and information by being able to watch the, those deliberations on a Zoom or some other type of virtual format. So we'll have a combination of those two. So um, I think most everybody globally or at least nationally realizes there's going to be a significant change in how businesses operate and how government operates, but exactly how that's going to mean uh, in, in physical terms uh, really kind of we'll have to wait and see. But I think um, um, Councilman Tenney's and Councilman Shiska's comment about um, 
how do we invest in that now um, is a difficult decision. And we have to just maintain some flexibility to see what is really going to be needed and, and how effective we can be. Because um, I had some concerns about um, maybe not having a sufficiently large uh, city hall chamber. But by the same token, if it's properly planned and, and has some flexibility, we, we can probably adapt to that. What, what, what you're talking, I know that Sarah had a comment, which I'll get to in just a second, but uh, what you're talking about is technological evolution. Um, I remember in 1972 or 73 and, and uh, that there was a bill passed in the legislature that allowed for micrographic reproductions to be used as evidence in court. Well, you know micrographic reproduction is, it's a Xerox copy, but they didn't allow them before that and it took a state law. Well, this year they changed the rules in the House and the Senate, actually they started to do it last May, to allow for uh, uh, voting and they said, but you've, you know, you've got to be on, you've got to be physically on the screen. We've got to be able to see you so we know that you're actually the person who's voting. Is on the, that's technological uh, evolution. That's going to happen. And I think all that the pandemic has done was has given us a nudge to get further along in that. Sarah? Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak to, I guess, this co concept that the virtual options somehow you know, are easier or um, continuing those would be, you know, people being lazy. Um, I can assure you as a person that conducts the council meetings that it is not easier <laughs> to no, do sure them virtually. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and clerks over the last year and a half or so have really had, there's been so much conversation around, well, how is your municipality doing it? And are you doing a hybrid? Are you doing exclusively virtual? Are your council members in chambers? Are your council members at home? How do we get them to mute themselves? You know, there's all these different things that come along with the virtual, particularly when you're doing it in a hybrid fashion, in addition to the general function of properly running a city council meeting. Um, and we're receiving so much feedback from our citizens all over the state and all over the country that they do like the option of having both. And so as clerks, we're really having to look at how does that, how do we fit into that box within our legal parameters and all those kinds of things and how we're going to be able to conduct our meetings moving forward. But I do think that that hybrid model is going to continue, and that's definitely something that we're going to need to consider when we're looking at potential for a new city hall and a new council chambers and what our chambers looks like. And I really appreciate Mayor Potential's comments with regard to having it be a multifaceted space so that if it's large and we're not utilizing it exclusively for council meetings, we're able to utilize it for other purposes. I think that's really important. Well, and a new chambers gives us the opportunity to invest in better technology and really outfit the chambers the way it needs to be to to be able to you know have these hybrid meetings long term. So it's not such a burden on Sarah every single meeting. I mean, Mr. Blair was just saying, you know, TVs. Yeah, you need screens. You need big screens because you need to facilitate because she can't see who's saying something unless it's on a screen that she can see and then maybe you have multi-modular so that you've got the big screen on the small screen and so, I mean it's mind-boggling I can't keep up with it okay uh, younger age groups let's be honest about it are more technologically savvy on what would work in a in a uh, hybrid hybrid type system um, but clearly some of what we are doing now that the pandemic has forced us to do will carry over because either it is a better way to do it or it's a more convenient way to do it or because we just prefer to do it that way where we didn't have the choice before. So I think your comments definitely were appropriate. Other comments on, on the service-oriented culture? All right, we, we are exactly on schedule. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, you'll be pleased to know that. Um, I th 
think it would be appropriate for us the food is ready for, so I, I'd like to turn it back to Mayor Mangarelli and to Michael uh, to kind of wind up because I think we've got what we need to go ahead and do the drafting uh, and then get it back out to you. Mayor, do you mind if I start? Uh, yeah, okay, I, thank you. This is for everybody in the room, specifically the staff in the back. I, you know, as you go through documents like this and you revisit your goals and what you've tried to accomplish. Uh, I just want to thank everybody because I really think this script has been followed. We've done a lot to meet the, uh, the goals and objectives through various strategies in this document. And I know sometimes governments get, uh, what's the right word? Pigeonholed as someone or an entity that doesn't follow a plan. We're following this plan and revisiting this once a year uh, I think is important, but kudos to everybody that's worked towards following this plan. It's just my comment. Yeah, very good. I echo that, Michael. You know, sometimes these get shelved and you forget, and five years later you wonder what it was that you had decided to do. And in this case, uh, particularly annually, looking at this is very helpful, and you leading the staff in such a way that you keep this in front of them uh, I think you've done a good job with that. And I do want to thank, on behalf of the council, the staff behind me. Uh, thank you guys for all of your work. Appreciate all that you do for the city and, and carrying out these goals that the council uh, puts together. You've done a tremendous job, and we're very proud of you. And it's gratifying to go through this list, as Michael said, and you see things that you're checking off that, that were done. And so uh, very cool. I want to thank everybody for their participation. Thank you, Barry, for facilitating, not always an easy job with uh, lots of different ideas coming at you, but appreciate your help as always. And uh, I think with that, this meeting is adjourned.